Yes? Who is this? Mm, who are you trying to reach? What number is this? What number are you trying to reach? I don't know. Well, I think you have the wrong number. Do I? It happens. Take it easy. I hate scary movies. I should be studying. You know I got a bio. Baby, did I mention that these tickets are free? I was so desperate when I wrote it. I couldn't pay my bills, and my car payment was due, and my and I was three months behind on my rent. So um, I came up with this idea for a scary movie, which later became Scream, and I went off um, to the desert for three days and locked myself in a room, and I pounded it out. And uh, came back, gave it to my agent, threw it out on the market, and by the end of the day, there was four or five people bidding on it. Everyone else had called and said, we like it, we're going to buy it, but we hadn't heard from Miramax yet. One person from Miramax had called and said, we read the script, but we've got to give it to Bob and Harvey. They haven't read it yet. The next morning, it was like 9 o'clock in the morning, we got a call from Miramax say, you know, it's saying, okay, Bob read it, he loved it, he wants to buy it, how much? The first time I had Scary Movie, which was the title of the script at that time, come across my desk, uh, Lisa Harrison, who was at that my time, uh, at that time I director of development uh, slipped it to me on a Friday and said, you have to read this over the weekend because it's going to be a big bidding war next week and maybe we can get somebody to buy it for us. And uh, at that time, we didn't have a deal with Miramax or Dimension or anything. And I read it and I thought, wow, this is really powerful. Um, but uh, came Monday morning, it had already been bought. There was a bidding war over the weekend that we didn't even know about. So uh, Dimension, Miramax owned it. Bob understood it. Bob loved the genre. I mean, Halloween was one of his favorite movies. It was one of my favorite movies. We bonded instantly. We both looked at each other and said, well, who should direct it? And the next thing you know, Wes came on board, and it was just magic from the get-go. And the opening 15 minutes of Scary Movie was so hard, I almost didn't want to go there again. Um, and then I sort of kicked myself in the pants and said, you know, you have a lot of fans that have been telling you you should go back and do a real kick-ass movie again. And I said, if ever there was a kick-ass movie, it's, it's a scary movie. So I called up Bob and I said, okay, I'm going to do it. The first 30 pages were perhaps the most compelling 30 pages of a script I've ever read. I couldn't put it down. I was terrified, which was fun to be terrified during a read. And, and as I, it always is with me in scripts, it's, I instantly start thinking about what it's like with an actor and what that's going to feel like in a movie, and I just said, I have to make this film. Uh, hello? Why don't you want to talk to me? Who is this? You tell me your name, I'll tell you mine. <laughs> I don't think so. When we got the call from Drew, I mean, Drew to her, Drew read this and wanted to be in the movie. And, um, you know, we, we, we were like blessed. We're like Drew, who grew up kind of in some of her early films in this type of genre. We're like, wow, how perfect is that? This is something I've always dreamed to do, you know? But I had no idea how challenging it was going to be until I got involved with the project. It made it a whole different kind of picture right there. Drew Barrymore opening up a horror film and then dying, you know, in 10 minutes. Uh, that was unprecedented. The alternate ending to the movie. <laughs> she lives. She away. It was a calculated risk, and uh, we didn't know whether the audience would even forgive us for that. Um, they did, thankfully. But uh, yeah, it was it was a very risky film in many many ways. The casting was really fun. For, for one thing, uh, 
the original budget really did not afford uh, the kind of people that we eventually got. And the reason was because with Drew Barrymore aboard and uh, perhaps something to do with my directing it also and the script, then that drew other people. So uh, it sort of had a snowball effect as one really brilliant young actor after another committed to it, then others would say, oh, you mean she's in it, he's in it. And uh, they read the script and they said, my God, this is incredible, I want to be in it too. We ended up with just uh, the absolutely best cast that I've ever had a chance to direct and I think one of the best casts in this kind of movie ever. You know, if I was wrong about Cotton Weary, then the killer's still out there. But don't go there, Sam. You're starting to sound like some Wes Carpenter flick or something. And I think Scream actually was one of the first movies again to kind of capitalize on the television world and kind of find young actresses and actors that hadn't really kind of broken through into the feature world. When I came on board, we already knew Drew Barrymore is going to be in this movie. And that was the only person that had already been set. So when Drew came on, ultimately within three or four weeks, she decided that the role that she wanted was of Casey Becker. And then we had to start our search for Sidney Prescott. Marcus. Mark. Ready and action. Ring. Ring. Practice ran late. I'm on my way. It's, it's, it's past seven. Don't worry. Casey and Steve didn't bite it till way after ten. I'm not worried. Good, because I want to swing by Blockbuster and get us a video. I was thinking Tom Cruise and all the right moves. You know, if you pause it just right, you can see his penis. Whatever. Just hurry, okay? Bye. I had actually just done the craft the year before and then was doing Party of Five and it was my second hiatus and wasn't necessarily sure whether I wanted to do another scary type of movie. Um, so I wasn't very certain about the choice, um, but I knew that I wanted to work with Wes, and I went in and auditioned for him, and he gave great direction, so that was, it was actually a fun process. I like auditioning. It was a hard search because the, you had to have the actress who was vulnerable as well as being really strong, and that's a tough dichotomy to find in um, an actress. Nev Campbell, I'd seen her work on uh, Party of Five, and uh, when I first met her, I said, oh, gosh, she looks so sort of soft and kid next door. I wonder if she has any idea what she's in for, you know, with this uh, incredibly demanding role. I actually said to her, I said, no, this is going to be like uh, boot camp. It's going to be like going into the Marines. Are you ready? She said, I'm ready. I thought, well, maybe she is, maybe she isn't. But uh, Nev turned out to be incredibly resourceful, both as an actress and just as a physical human being. So there's a tremendous amount of uh, running, jumping, climbing, falling, um, fight scenes, an incredible amount of scenes of very, very high emotion, terror and grief and everything else, and just does a terrific job. And you begin to realize this woman is an, a real powerhouse. I mean, she's really an actress to be reckoned with. So, how's the book? Well, it'll be out later this year. Oh, I'll look for it. I'll send you a copy. <laughs> I, I think for the role of, of Gail Weathers, that was the one that we were really focusing on, that we definitely wanted to have a recognizable actress. Hi, Gail Weathers is reporting live from Woodsworth Police Station. Station. Hey, where's she going? a glimpse of Sydney Prescott. Hey, watch her, Larry. Hey, watch the hand. Mm -hmm. You know what you're dealing with here? I wanted to play the part of Gail Weathers because she was just a total bitch, and it was something that I hadn't got to play um, in a while, at least being on Friends for so long. And I had to really do some persuading to get the part because most people think of me as the studious type or I play a doctor, but they didn't really see me as a bitch. So I had to try really hard to get this part. You look awfully young to be a police officer. I'm 25 years old. You know, in a demographic study, I proved to be most popular amongst males 11 to 24. I guess I just missed you. <laughs> I had a meeting for the role of Billy. And when I came in, I said, I don't, I really don't think that's the part I'd like to play. I sort of like, like the role of Dewey. And everyone sort of like stopped and was like, whoa. Because they didn't really sort of picture it that way. And, you know, it was written sort of like this big honky guy. <laughs> so I was like, I guess it was a little forward of me, but they sort of went, oh, well. And then I guess Wes sort of liked the idea and it just kind of worked out. It was very uh, heaven sent for me. Dewey's character could have easily been slapstick, but David always brings it back to somebody who is really a true person. To me, it's always been one of the most interesting things to do in the genre is to start with situations that could be cliché or characters that could be cliché and then make it human, because it always catches everybody off guard and, and makes it much more powerful. The, you uh, media type, y'all come in here thinking you're badasses. All righty, here we go. Here's a small town. Very good, here we go. Yeah, I'm Bye. 
Watch your P's and Q's. I will never forget the audition that Skeet gave. And he was, I was sitting here, I was reading the Sydney role when they're in the bedroom. Um, and he was, you know, about two feet, three feet away from me, and he was reading it, and it was just like, wow, God, you're just the most amazing actor. I started thinking about us and how two years ago, you know, we were kind of hot and heavy, and we were definitely an R rating on our way to an NC-17, and then, you know, something changed. Lately, we're just sort of edited for television. Oh, so you thought you would climb my window and we'd... Have a little rough footage. <laughs> no, no, I wouldn't dream of breaking your underwear rule. Jamie Kennedy was another one of those actors who came into my office. He didn't have that much experience. I think he just finished working on Romeo and Juliet. He came into my office, and it was so clear that he was perfect for the role of Randy. So he came in the next day for the producer and director, and uh, they fell in love with him. We were absolutely crazy about Jamie Kennedy. He, he was so clearly this role of Randy and that nobody really could have, have done it better. Don't you know the rules? What rules? There are certain rules that one must abide by in order to successfully survive a horror movie. For instance, one. You can never have sex. Big no no! Big no no! Dead man. Sex equals death, okay? Number two, you can never drink or do drugs. No. The sin factor, it's an extension of number one. And three, never, ever, ever, under any circumstances, say, uh, I'll be right back. Hey, you want another beer? Yeah. I'll be right back. There he goes, folks, a dead man. Wait, bye-bye. Bye, dead boy. Bye. He's dead. What do you have back? We had so much fun on Scream 1. We wouldn't have ever guessed it was going to make $100 million and start everything, you know? Start people's careers, launch people's careers. The first test screening we had, and the only test screening we had, the test scores went through the roof. I just had the feeling, filming certain scenes that this was extraordinary stuff, you know? Right before Christmas, Variety had done a story that predicted we would be DOA. I remember reading that and going, they've got balls, we're dead on arrival. We're not even getting like, you know, possibly may make, you know, we were DOA. And then this strange thing started happening. Our weekday numbers just kept growing and, and Wes and Marianne and I would call each other. We're like, oh my God, it's like something's happening. And it just kept going and going and going. And it was, it was a great feeling. Scream One was really special. I think the timing was so right, you know, and that's what I was banking on when I wrote the script. And that's why I wrote it so quickly, because I thought someone else was going to come along and make a scary movie or make a teenage movie. And I'm going to, you know, and I'm going to have missed my chance. I saw an opportunity to really sort of take a stab. I, and I wrote the movie really quickly so that I could get it out there as quickly as possible. And, um, and it paid off. I think it was so successful because, first of all, it was a it was a great horror film. It was scary. It was a scary movie in its simplest of terms but also it's the type of film that invites its audience to come back more and more and notice different things every time. In Scream, they talked about uh, Halloween. They talked about, you know, real films that they had seen and kind of the rules that they had drawn up around those films. I want to see Jamie Lee's breast. When do yes. we see Jamie yes. Lee's breast? Breast? Not until Trading Places in 83. Jamie Lee was always the virgin in horror movies. She never showed her tits until she went legit. That third wall was broken, and the audience was drawn into a film that was real people talking about real films. And that, I think that awareness that they were in situations that were similar to films that they'd seen opened that whole door to the way that media, films, and television have influenced uh, the last several generations of kids. I thought that it really had a sense of humor, uh, and it was the first movie that, I, that, that I'd ever read in that genre that that was sort of really willing to poke fun at itself in a very intelligent way. It came at a time where people's humor was getting a little, a little sharper in a sense, a little more cynical or sarcastic. You make me so sick. Your entire havoc-inducing, thieving, whoring generation disgusts me. It's the first, like, quote, horror movie that I've ever read that, or seen that, really kind of stuck to the characters instead of the blood and gut factor. Characters are really well drawn. It's brought back a horror genre that Halloween started, I think, that we haven't seen in a while. And there's a lot of violence in the first screen, but I can't justify it. It's very violent, but uh, it's f fun. Fun, fun, fun. I think 
a lot of their success is due to the fact that they are such fun, dark roller coasters. The second and third one especially are, are very much just designed to be to be a roller coaster ride, to take you on a, on a journey that goes up and down and, and to throw things at you that you don't expect. It's not the monster under your bed, it's the kid next door. Sydney, come on, you know me. Come on, come on. Sydney, look at me. Give me trouble. Come on. For Wes, I think, since he, you know, worked in the genre many times before, he wasn't really interested in repeating himself. He wasn't interested in, you know, doing an homage to himself. He was more interested in doing something new, um, and I think maybe somewhat visually, but I think more with the characters. Realization that audiences are much smarter now. I really wrote the script for the read because I wanted to sell it. I wanted people in Hollywood to go, oh, this is some cool dialogue. There's some cool characters. These are some cool plot twists. And I hadn't really written it for the, you know, we had to turn it into a shooting script. We had to take the action scenes that were written where I would just put, you know, girl runs through woods and really turn it into a scary sequence. And that was where, you know, the mastery of Wes Craven comes into play because he knows exactly how to do all that stuff. When Wes came to us, he, you know, this wasn't a monster movie and it didn't have a ton of effects in it. Um, but what we were doing was kind of vital to the movie. You know, we had a few uh, the old fashioned gore gags with the collapsible knives and uh, blood tubing rigs and stuff like on Drew at the beginning of the movie when she's being pursued. One of the effects we did was with the scene where Drew Barrymore gets killed and she came in and we life cast her and then we made the dummy and you know Bob took it out there to shoot with it and, and dressed it up all bloody and we went through a lot of blood on that show actually. Oh, what we do for, oh, for we fun. just cut my hair? Oh. No, okay good. Wes and I spent so much time together preparing for this film. I needed to build a real trust with him in order to do a performance like this. One of the things I said to him was, I need the voice, because we knew that the voice for the film would be really scary, but I said I need that, I need that person. You never told me your name. Why do you want to know my name? I want to know who I'm looking at. Well, Roger, the voice on the telephone, you just had a voice of intelligence and malevolence, and he could really get into it, and we brought him onto the set when Drew was not there and we hit him in a part of the house where she never saw him and she never, I don't think she ever met him. So his voice was a complete mystery and totally in that character for her. Listen, asshole! No, you listen, you little bitch. You hang up on me again, I'll cut you like a fish, understand? Films are only scary if you feel like you could be in those situations if you can relate to those characters. And if it's too stylized, I think it pulls you out. The first one was shot in Northern California. You know, there's a lot of trees and green, and, you know, it's a very beautiful setting. The, the style kind of builds on that. Because there were so specific things in the script, you know, the, the glass from the first house, or the vulnerability of the outside, the garage door, and the attic that Nev has to run through and then jump out the window and then onto the driveway to see the... I mean, all of that's in the script, and we find houses that we could do all of that and shoot in without major building, which was remarkable. It's kind of like an eerie house. Actually, two people have died in this house. Literally, two people have died in the house. So coming up the hill and you're doing a Wes Craven film, and somebody tells you, oh, by the way, two people have died in the house, it brings an entirely new thing. It's kind of a tragic house in that the owners passed away when they were building it. They never really finished the house because they died so suddenly. It sits there on the top of the hill. It's just like a haunted house, and it's kind of designed that in a few years, if they don't paint it, it'll look like a haunted house. I believe it was eight or nine screenings that we had to go back uh, to the MPA in order, in order to get an R rating. They were very much on us for, uh, for the death of uh, Casey's boyfriend at the beginning, for the death of Casey herself, especially when she's hanging from the tree. And then, again, the, the whole ending in general they had huge problems with, the, the Billy and Stu stabbing each other. Ready? Yeah. Yeah! I'm ready, baby! Hey, Knight! Get up! Yeah, man, get up! Hey, I had the feeling, in fact, I turned to the crew at one point and said, this will never get onto the screen, but if it does, it's going to make a bajillion dollars because it was so different and so shocking. That last scene, actually, it was so bloody. It was so bloody watching them all stand there for days on end with drench. They'd come out with the little squirt guns and just squirt them all down in blood. And I just went, Wes, it's kind of a bloody movie. 
I said, why is there so, you know, I said, the blood's kind of disturbing me a little bit. I'm kind of queasy. I don't like seeing all this blood. And he just handed me the script and said, okay, well, the writer really wrote this scene about two guys who cut each other up in a kitchen, nearly killing themselves. And um, maybe you could tell me how to do it without blood. And, and I just kind of went, okay, all right, back to the trailer. Get out of there. The writer's not wanted anymore. I know during the opening scene, the, the studio had seen dailies and were a little bit worried you know, about how it was going to work because Wes had done it at, at essentially a lot of steady cam shots. So when you see it, it may have seemed like it wasn't going to work as well as, as it did. Um, and just based on that, the five days of dailies, we cut it together and uh, sent it off to Wes with no other feedback other than this is the footage. And Wes uh, changed this one music cue and then we fired it off to the studio and they loved it. <laughs> Even while we were shooting the first one, Kevin was talking about he had an idea for the second and that he had actually conceived of it as a trilogy. First attraction to this was just a really terrific first script, but uh, the fact that he had the idea for two more and that it all formed a sort of interconnected story was really fascinating to me. First movie sort of said, don't blame the movies. Well, part two basically is saying, well, then who do you blame? Who do you blame? And if you notice, the killer turned out to be the mother. So Billy Loomis's mother. So you know, it's so, some, some sort of weird sort of underlying way I was saying, come on people, you wanna blame someone, blame the home. It all starts in the home. It all starts with mom and dad. Mrs. Loomis? What? Billy's mother! Nice twist, huh? Didn't see it coming, did you? In terms of the sequel, I think we all knew what we were getting ourselves into because it, it, you know, the idea was to take the roller coaster to the next step as, as best we could and, and to give a more elaborate ride. Number one, the body count is always bigger. Number two, the death scenes are always much more elaborate. More blood, more gore. Carnage, candy. I think there was a big fear that we were going to curtail the, you know, fright factor because of just society, you know, as it is now. But I think that this is the kind of movie it is. And I don't think you can shortchange your, your audience. Probably, for my mind, the most effective scene in Scream 2 is the opening, uh, especially when we previewed it. And people originally, all through that scene, they're, they're very into it. You know, the, all you see all the ghosts running around. And, and it's this and it's very kind of macabre setting and, and kind of the way it's commenting on itself. And at the end of it, when she is up on stage and, and then dies and it collapses into complete silence, there's a whole silence in the theater because nobody knows how to take that. What are you saying about the very audience who's sitting in this room watching it in this film within a film within a film? You know, it was just a lot of fun to make. Um, and so I said, well, with this cast and, you know, the whole concept, it should be really fun. Of course, I get to work with the master, which is Wes Craven. It doesn't get any better than that. If you're gonna do horror, do it right. Let's go one more time. Nick, let's back in the background with the big uh, stabs. I was excited. I was just like, let's do it, you know? And, and, and especially once I found out, you know, Jada and I were gonna be in it together. So I was like, let's go have fun, you know? <laughs> Sorry, I had to, baby. I actually signed on before I got to read the script. That's how confident I was that I wanted to be a part of this. I enjoyed the first one so much and just had thought such wonderful things about it. And I love the horror genre and I love the comedy and I love Kevin's writing. And I was really would love to work with Wes that I signed on without reading it, which is something I've never done. I was a fan of horror movies as a kid. It was the thing to do, to go to someone's house and scare yourself to death and of course after the horror movie you tell the worst possible stories so i am just so delighted to work with wes because it's like it really is like a horrific nightmare come true i read for about three characters <laughs> i read for every character in the movie i read for cc i read for hallie and i read for maureen so it was interesting to be offered this role because it's it's nothing like the other characters that i auditioned for but i guess wes you know, could sort of see something that would coincide with this character. I think that she's shy. She's just really shy. And cut. It's one of my favorite genres, so uh, getting to do one is sort of almost like a dream come true. Well, I think I love you. Isn't that what life is made of? And though it worries me to say, I've never felt this way. Hey, I think I love you, so what am I so afraid of? 
the thing I remember the most in Scream 2, the effect I think uh, that is there the most in the film is the uh, the pull through the head of um, the, Chris Doyle. Yeah, swerving the car around and they wreck into like a construction site and this steel pipe goes through the back of the guy's head who's on top of the car. And so it was supposed it. to go, I think, through his shoulder. Yeah. And it ended up going right through, through, his through head, the center right of his head. Right through the center of the head. And Wes like, oh, that's, right. that's cool. <laughs> so we got a call like, oh, we might have to remake the dummy. And I was like, ah. Uh. And then Wes called like, oh, no, no, it went through the head. It was great. It was interesting, the MPAA on that film, we, we jacked up the film when we submitted to them. We went, Omar Epps gets stabbed in the ear. We cut him getting stabbed in the ear three times. And Randy's death, we played out so long and bloody and violent that he just got stabbed forever. Because we're thinking, OK, they're going to cream us so then we can peel back to what we want. And they gave us an R, first time out, because they felt the, the message of the film was, was much more significant and that they were, was much more in tune with what they liked in terms of how that opening comedy that set them up for the whole rest of the movie. When I was first hired for the job, I didn't know at the end of each movie if I was going to make it. All the characters I created around the main character of Sydney, I knew were, you know, fair game. They could, you know, they, they were ex either they're the killer or they're a victim, one or the other. You know, conversations with Wes and myself, and then I think conversations with the producers and everything was, you know, shoot the shot of, do we get him put in the ambulance? He's a great character. Who knows? Maybe you want it. Maybe, and we don't have to cut it in. If we want him to die, you know, we, we can have him die, but we might want it. Of course, the second we got it, we cut it in and never cut it out. Yeah. Do we? Go. Oh, I can't believe you're alive. Are you okay? Yeah. You hang in there. Like you. Lucky. Knife went into some old scar tissue. Saved his life. I'm coming with you. It was always planned to be a trilogy. I think the surprise for everybody was that they would happen so quick next to one another. In Scream 3, there was, uh, not only was it an effort to try and keep them interesting, but there's also a, was a concern, um, given the kind of political kind of climate about the violence in cinema, that, you know, we, how violent can we be? Stone's death, I know, is one thing that we went back and shot some more stuff on, because uh, we killed him the first time, and we decided he went too easy. <laughs> so we went back and bashed him up some more. <laughs> In terms of the ending, which we went back and they shot for uh, four days on, Wes concocted the whole thing of, of Roman getting the upper hand, because orig originally she hit him with the chair. The trick was it was important to believe that, yes, she was going to lose. And so that, that became a really important thing, because never in, that was the key thing we discussed that was different than the other two, because never in the other two did you ever really feel she's going to lose. But it's important in this one that you think, finally, yes, this is it. Just stand back. Do it! Scary movies have always thrilled me. I always wanted to be in one, actually. When I was younger, this is so retarded, but I'm telling it anyway. I used to dream of being the movie star. I used to practice walking down a hallway and scared, like, who's there? So it was kind of perfect and ironic that I got to be in this. It's like, this is so surreal. I can't believe I'm in a Wes Craven movie. Here's how I see it. I've got no house, no bodyguard, no movie, and I'm being stalked. Because someone wants to kill me? No, because someone wants to kill you. So now, starting now, I go where you go. That way, if someone wants to kill me, I'll be with you. And since they really want to kill you, they won't kill me. They'll kill you. Make sense? None. Very, very interesting progressions. Many of the familiar faces from the other screams are in the Scream 3 to find their final resolution in a very, very interesting way that you couldn't have had if it was just, uh, you know, another sequel with all new characters and just the same killer. Wes is so great. Everyone loves working for him. The one thing about our, our movies, I will brag, is that everyone has such a great time and they just say how much more fun they have on our movies than anyone else's. Let's not give away the magic, ladies. A lot of people think, oh, Wes Craven, you know, he makes all these horror films, he's got to be really sick and really twisted, and they always ask me that, and he's actually not. He's very zen in a lot of ways. He's a very calm spirit. He keeps a very cool atmosphere on set, and he's very warm and deep in a lot of ways. Working with Wes Craven is a dream. I feel like at this point he's like my father. I don't feel like there's anything I can't say or do in front of him or be. I don't think there's any line they can't cross. Are you taping this? This is Wes doesn't like to be taped after two o'clock. Javari has to have his tea. Cut the ah!
utilizes what we all do well and allows us to bring it in as opposed to like saying, no, no, no. He's more of a yes and person. Yes and do this, yes and do this. I thought that maybe he was gonna be a little quirky, a little wild, a little crazy, and you know, maybe a little offbeat. <laughs> I'd be a little afraid of him, <laughs> you know, more so than the script. <laughs> but he is so calm and he is so wonderful and he's great. I went to NYU Film and uh, I took a class called the horror genre and half of the class is dedicated to Wes. And I actually have two papers that I wrote on two separate Wes Craven films, The First Nightmare on Elm Street and, and one of his earlier ones. I was thinking about bringing him in so he could sign him, but I don't know, I think that might be kind of pushing it. It's so nice working with such a great director because Wes really, really knows how to do it. And some of the cute anecdotes that he used to do before he said action was, um, I was going into this office and he would say, Ooh, what's that noise? It's scary. Action. Well, how do you not laugh, you know? He's trying to, like, make the little build-up, but I think he's just a little doll, and I'm so glad I got to work with him. I hold him responsible a lot for, for David and I getting together. I think that he was really instrumental in that, as far as just, like, being an overseer and saying, look, guys, this is what you have. I see you guys together. And I just think he was really, he was, he's just kind of a... I don't want to see a father figure because he's not old enough to be a father figure. Well, actually, I think he is. <laughs> this is a case where a film was um, really just a great place to shoot, and at the same time, it's turned out terrifically well. Diet Coke and hard nipples, that's what it's all about. <sighs> and blood in a minute. Did that fuck you up if I lean in a little bit? I'll let you fall off and break your silly neck. Hello. Hello. Who is this? If you tell me your name, I'll tell you mine. <laughs> I don't think so. What's that noise? Popcorn. You making popcorn? Well, I'm getting ready to watch a video. Really? What? Well, it's just some scary movie. You like scary movies? Uh-huh. You never told me your name. Why do you want to know my name? Because I want to know who I'm looking at. <laughs> Scared you? Traps you. Fear. I don't trust anyone. Ever. Feels good to get things out in the open. And scream about them. <laughs> it is a film about a group of kids that uh, all love scary movies who are then put in a situation where they are being preyed on by an anonymous killer. They find themselves unwillingly uh, sometimes in those very cliché situations they sort of thought were so clever and, and fun to watch when they're watching scary movies. Hello? Hello, Sydney. You like scary movies? What's the point? They're all the same. Some stupid killer stalking some big-breasted girl who can't act who's always running up the stairs when she should be going out the front door. It's insulting. There are certain rules that one must abide by in order to successfully survive a scary movie. Number one, you can never have sex. Sex uh, equals yes. death. Don't have sex, you die. That, that would pretty much be Wes Craven's message to youth of America. Abstinence, key. Never, ever, ever under any circumstances say, I'll be right back. Because you won't be back. I'm getting another beer. You want one? Yeah, sure. I'll be right back. Oh! It goes from being sort of funny as you recognize classic film situations to terrifying when you see that it's really happening. And uh, kind of baffling and intriguing because all of these things become sort of woven up in a single net of who is the killer, and uh, which is kind of an impenetrable uh, mystery, as it turns out in this film. The police are always off track. If they watch prom night, they'd save time. There's a formula to it. A very simple formula. Everybody's a suspect. The first 30 pages of the script were probably like the most exciting 30 pages that I'd ever read. I freaked out. And I put it down. And then I finished the next day during the light. So who are you? The question isn't who am I? The question is where am I? So where are you? Your front porch. Why would you be calling from my front porch? That's the original part. 
Oh ya? Yeah? Well, I call you bluff. Uncovering the dark side of yourself and confronting it and chasing it away. That's what the movie's been about to me. <laughs> I was definitely dealing with a, a lot of depth in the character. When you try and find the, those levels, when you find a character, you don't want to just go with what's on the page. I do a lot of um, fighting with a couple of the characters in the film. Man, that was a good punch. Nev, you nailed it. Looks like we've got a serial killer on our hands. Well, serial killer's not really accurate. Gotta knock off a couple more to get that title. Well, we can hope, can't we? <laughs> I've always been a Wes Craven fan. I'm, t I'm scared of him. <laughs> Wes Craven was sitting in the, the lobby of Miramax, and I knew I recognized, as soon as I got off the elevator, I was like, that's Wes Craven, that's Wes Craven. And I had someone come up and they said, Wes, Kevin, Kevin, Wes. He went, Kevin Williamson? I said, yeah, he goes, he goes, I read your script. It was really scary. And I thought, I can lay down and die. Well, it was funny because, you know, I mean, my name's even mentioned. The killer's still out there. Don't go there, Sam. You're starting to sound like some West Carpenter flick or something. Um, Nightmare on Elm Street. Is that the one where the guy had knives for fingers? Yeah, Freddy Krueger. Freddy, that's right. I like that movie. It was scary. Well, well the first one was, but the rest sucked. I kind of wanted to take that out, you know. I did not write that line. With the amalgamation of Kevin's script and Wes's direction, I knew you couldn't go wrong because Wes would bring Kevin's brilliance to life in the most graceful way. It's like, you know, you're a junkie. You want that, you know, you want that scary feeling. And a lot of people, you know, it's like a drug. You want more. <laughs> You want to go into a dark theater, have the lights turn out, and just there's something about being scared out of your wits that has always appealed to me, and I think it appeals to everybody. They go to scary movies because they already have certain fears, and the movie brings it out in a way that's fun because you know you're not going to be hurt. If something has been exercised, some, some terrible tension has been relieved momentarily, and so it performs some sort of uh, arcane service to the psyche. Ready, in. Anything else you want, Wes Craven, director of this major motion picture? No. Oh. Spicy, spicy. Of course you want something. That's good, Mary Jane. Yes, sir. David, <laughs> um, a couple things. I'm, I'm just keeping an eye on things. This is the first time I'm checking things out because you're checking out the party. And uh, 
Oh, stupid. And then you, you do the jump first, and then you take your head off. Right. Not, come in and... Go! Scared. <laughs> Why can't I do it? Tony will be back this far. I'll send you a copy. One more. When you see him do the oh shit and look and then come back out like that, I think that curiosity should be the face around. Okay. Right, right, so rather than looking back to his home. Okay. Like, what is it? Yeah. So just keep We're looking? Well, once once he goes out and looks, just keep looking like he's out. going to help. Then he comes back and looks. So then you look, right? Because he's looking. Right. And then he goes back and you're like, okay, like, where's he going? What's going on? No, you just turn back. Oh. So, but the first time you don't want me to look out when he looks out? Sure. Oh, okay. But when he goes out the second time, don't he just drink that. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Roll, sir. We're rolling. Rolling! Mark it. Okay, only 106 out and take five marker. Set here. Okay, roll video. Roll. Lots of animation right here. Oh, shit, behind you, kid! Behind you! <laughs> Ready? Ready and action! Strange things like uh, Repulsion and The Tenant. I love Hitchcock films. Um, I love uh, Night of the Living Dead. I like Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I love 
just about anything Cronenberg did uh, when he was doing that, uh, those kind of genre films. Um, Alien, you know, I, I have very eclectic tastes. The Shining was pretty freaky. Um, you know, that you could call that a horror film because it's really disturbing. <laughs> I, I'd say probably The Shining. I also saw one called The Changeling that really freaked me out. Because it was about, you know, spirits. And when it comes to spirits, you know, I have more of a belief in spirits. Or it seems more real. Whatever happened to Baby Jane is my favorite scary movie. My favorite scary movie would probably be um, Rosemary's Baby. Definitely Psycho. Yeah. Friday the 13th, you know, the original. And I remember going with my friends and I just thought, oh my god. I mean, it was just, it was great. It was quite the ride. Salem's Lot. Straw Dogs. I thought it was, you know, a clockwork orange, that kind of scary movie, not as intense as, you know, as Wes is. A different kind of scary movie. I like old movies like Gaslight and things like that. I find those more like the psychological thrillers, like kind of more terrifying. A long time ago, and I'm dating myself, but there was a film, I think, with Vincent Price called 13 Ghosts, and that was scary. Terror Train scared the hell out of me. Clown masks coming at me with a knife. I just remember being just terrified by just movies like The Birds, or, um, you know, Exorcist, you know, things like that. The movie that I remember upsetting me the most was The Exorcist, I think. And I, I'm not a smoker, but I remember I smoked seven cigarettes in a row when I watched that movie and threw up immediately afterwards. Probably one of the greatest impact, which is kind of cool with this, was Halloween. Seeing some of the, the scenes cut together here, I can remember, you know, being in high school and going to see that movie. And the impact, you know, that just sitting on the edge of my seat. And, and that's why that's why you wanted to take girls to those kind of movies, you know. Because I can just imagine, you know, my teenage equal nowadays. Get her and she gets real scared and she might want to hold hands, you know, and all that stuff. And they get scared. <laughs> that's why, that's another reason I like those, those scary movies. Burnt offerings. I still think about the color of that swimming pool and that little boy was under there and that man was getting killed. It just gives me shivers. Ooh. Nightmare on the street, probably. I mean, I don't know. I want to push it, but... <laughs> I um, watched Halloween when I was 10 years old, and it was the scariest movie I ever saw in my life. In fact, it's my favorite movie of all time. And it is the movie that is responsible for me being in the business of writing and being in the whole movie industry. So, I mean, for most people, it's Citizen Kane, Lawrence Arabia, but for me, it's Halloween. I think it's a great release of tension. Scary movies, somehow, um, they take you on a roller coaster ride, and they kind of address fears that you already have. And, you know, I don't think people like to be scared, so that's not why they go to scary movies. They go to scary movies because they already have certain fears, and the movie brings it out in a way that's fun because you know you, you're not going to be hurt. You know probably that the person that you're most identifying with, the hero or heroine, is going to survive and probably triumph. So, um, and, you, and you go with friends. So you come out sort of laughing and exhilarated and happy and... Um, Beyond that, it's a mystery. But I just know that audiences coming out of really scary films, the scarier their film are, the happier they seem to be. Everybody has a different form of excitement. Some people like to laugh, some like to cry, some like to be scared. And it's very obvious from all of the horror films that people love to be scared. And it's just something in them that on a 95 basis they don't get that kind of adrenaline. I think that there's a real visceral kind of relationship between the horror film and the horror fanatic. I mean, you go and you sit in the seat and you're checking out the film and you get a rush. There's an adrenaline rush. I, mean, I think kids go to amusement parks. I think they like to test their fear and survive and come out and happy and alive. And I think it's just a matter of that. People who like to go on Ferris wheels or roller coasters, same thing. They like to go to movies and scream their you know, guts out. Because people want to be scared. They're... Uh scary and they like to be shocked because people have regular jobs and they don't like see murders during the day in their life and they want to be shocked and jolted. We all have an evil side in us. There's always, you know, some kind of evil that lurks within our souls that, you know, we never get to act out. So to go and see a film and be entertained by those emotions and, and things that we never actually come through with in our lives is kind of a trip, you know. To watch someone else do that and watch someone else be evil <laughs> can get off on it, you know? <laughs> I think that's why. You want to be on a roller coaster ride. You want to go into a dark theater, have the lights turn out, and just there's something about being scared out of your wits that has always appealed to me, and I think it appeals to everybody. Even though, you know, it's not everyone's cup of tea, but 
there's something about being, you get the old adrenaline, adrenaline rush and just start shaking and screaming and then you walk out of the theater and you know you're just taken for a ride. Horror movies. Please, he's gonna try and kill me. Watching them is one thing, surviving them is another. There are certain rules that one must abide by in order to successfully survive a horror movie. You can never have sex. You can never drink or do drugs. Never, ever, ever say it. I'll be right back. Then along came a film that surprised Hollywood, critics, and audiences by daring to defy them all. There's a formula to it, a very simple formula. We took every single rule and broke it. And introduced moviegoers to a new kind of horror movie. You're starting to sound like some Wes Carpenter flick or something. I think what makes the Scream films original is the fact that they take a look at themselves and they take a look at the horror genre itself. And I think that was a very new concept. It was very, very acutely aware of the genre and kind of slyly announcing to the audience of, we know what you're thinking and you better hang on to your seats because we're going to do something different. It was a film that leaned on humor, but still managed to scare the hell out of audience. We're going to go over boundaries that you didn't think we'd go over. And not just in gore. It's not just a scary guy with a knife. It's, it's not knowing who that person is. No one had seen anything like that. This scary movie also attracted a hot young cast of up-and-comers. Everybody wanted to be in this movie. The fact that all these actors were just people I all I respected. And on December 20th, 1996, an unsuspecting holiday audience was taken by the throat. I didn't realize how scary the movie was going to be. Oh, I think this is probably going to work better than we expected. But with a screenplay in what was a dying genre... It was the worst timing in the world. Horror was done. A brand-name director who kept saying no. I think the reason that I passed on it was my usual stupidity. And a bitter controversy over a key filming location which divided an entire town. The local papers were actually attacking the production. Bringing this scary movie to the screen would come with its own set of challenges. I was so desperate when I wrote it. I couldn't pay my bills, and my car payment was due, and, my, and I was three months behind on my rent. Wes was really under the gun from the studio because they didn't see it. And in Hollywood parlance, that means you're about to be fired. You know, early on, we got an NC-17 rating. Is this going to be the nail in some people's careers, you know, in their career coffin? No, do it! This is the story of an unproven screenwriter a director in need of a hit, and a maverick studio that reinvented the rules of horror and made scary movies fun again. This is Inside Story Scream. By the mid-1990s, the infamous Unabomber was finally captured. Moviegoers flocked to Independence Day. Television's hottest shows were ER and Seinfeld. Everyone was doing the Macarena, and kids everywhere were playing with Tickle Me Elmo. But on December 20th, 1996, the horror movie Scream was released to film audiences ready for a new kind of terror. The Scream movie is something totally different. It, it was a movie that, that hit at the right time culturally, um, it recognized uh, it, the, you know, the pop icons of, of the past and then brought them into the fold in a way that was so uniquely entertaining. Those past genre icons, films such as Black Christmas, When a Stranger Calls, Halloween, Friday the 13th, and A Nightmare on Elm Street, were the spiritual fathers of Scream, a movie that would pay homage to them as much as it would break new ground. It's about a group of teenagers being terrorized and murdered. Um, but what made it unique was that it was a satire on those films. This scary movie tells the story of a seemingly typical teenage girl coming of age. She's surrounded by a close group of friends. She has a boyfriend with raging hormones. Okay, okay, time's over, stud buggy. A father whose life is one business trip after another. Have a good trip, okay? But Sydney Prescott's life is anything but ordinary as she tries to come to terms with the brutal murder of her mother one year ago. Only a year ago, Marie Prescott, wife and mother, was found raped and murdered not far from this peaceful town square. 
And just when things seem to be getting back to normal, the quiet town of Woodsboro is once again plagued by a killer. Someone targeting Sydney. Someone who is taking their love of scary movies one step too far. It's totally different, you know what I mean? And it's like, who knows what can happen? But there was more to this slasher movie than its cast being stalked by yet another masked murderer. I would describe Scream to a friend as a high school romp gone very, very wrong. Scream was so brilliant and so smart and funny, but it took the deaths and the scares very seriously. You have this group of kids talking about the killings and the quiet one, you know, Nev Campbell's character, Sydney Prescott, you don't know much about her at all. And then you see that she's tied into it all because there was a murder of her mother earlier on and this guy, Cotton Weary, is accused of it. You know, if I was wrong about Cotton Weary, then the killer's still out there. I think it would never been done before where there was a plot that was very intricate, very entangled with, uh, you know, hidden secrets. One of the most successful elements of the movie is the mystery element. And Scream taps into that. It taps into it beautifully. You were constantly guessing about who the killer could be. It could have been anyone. The killer's still on the loose, isn't he? Come on, Sid. Those murders are related. I think um, Sydney's past is coming back to haunt her, obviously because of uh, the murder of her mother and having to deal with that and, and having to overcome that. That kept it very grounded in something we all can really attach our emotions to. I feel like she's lived, she's been hurt, she's seen life. Your mother's murder was last year's hottest court case. Somebody was going to write a book about it. Right, and it had to be you with all your lies and theories. With a new, hip, and more modern sensibility, Scream set itself apart from slasher movies of the past. It was finally the movie where the characters had seen other movies. Terror Train, Prom Night, how come Jamie Lee Curtis is in all of these movies? I mean, it was basically saying, hey, you know what? We've seen all these movies. We know what's up. And we're going to spell it out. We're going to say what everyone's been thinking. And now, from this point forward, this is how horror movies are going to work. Oh, you want to play psycho killer? Can I be the helpless victim? Like many horror movies, Scream would open on a dark night with a young girl alone in her isolated house, but her solitude would quickly be shattered by a mysterious phone call. Hello? Hello? Yes? Who is this? Mm, who are you trying to reach? That quickly turned into a terrifying game. Listen to me. You hang up on me again, I'll cut you like a fish, understand? People thought, well, Drew Barrymore is going to be in the whole film. The fact that it's Drew Barrymore and she dies, it just tells you your preconceptions about this kind of movie are wrong. But there would be other potential victims, starting with Sydney's friends, who offered a unique but cynical view of teenage life in the 90s. Part of the brilliance of the script was the way the characters spoke to each other. There is kind of a, a numbness to to violence that obviously we're more excited by what's going on than horrified by what's going on. What? No way. And we're not just talking killed, we're talking splattered with being killed. Ripped open from end to end. These kids were too little too smart for their own good and wanting to see how far they could push it and what they could get away with. The first among them is Sydney's boyfriend, Billy, who despite his surface charms, would be the first of the film's many suspects. Do you wish to give yeah. up your right to remain silent? I didn't do anything. He's charming and he's mysterious and he's, uh, there's just a lot to him. Billy is a really interesting character because there is something wrong with him. He's cool and he's good looking, so he gets a pass, which happens in real life. Couldn't have been me, I was in jail, remember? Sydney's best friend and constant companion, Tatum Riley. I made her really wide-eyed and, and uh, just fun, not stupid, but just a kind of a great little effervescent being. Tatum's boyfriend and Billy's best friend, Stu Mocker. I had this, you know, this kind of crazy youth and this energy and was fearless and I just kind of was bouncing off the wall. <laughs> <laughs> I look back at that performance, I'm like, what was he letting me do? It was ridiculous. And finally, Randy Meeks, the quintessential geek who couldn't get the girl, but knew more than a thing or two about the inner workings of a horror movie. If they watch prom night, they'd save time. Oh, okay, we know everything that's gonna happen in horror movies, and so, you know, my character was the one that actually helped 
say that. It was like kind of the voice of the people. The Randy character is one of the most original characters in the script, the kid who knows the rules. It's a brilliant idea, and it's part of what made the movie so fresh because Randy is a real kid. The film was more than young people in Jeopardy. It also featured a host of adult characters, starting with the boyish and bumbling deputy of Woodsboro, Dewey Riley. Does the force require you to work out? No, ma'am. Because of my boyish good looks, muscle mass has increased my acceptance as a Sears police officer. I had different, uh, you know, traits and characteristics that I thought I could bring, like, a real sweet element to Dewey, and he's a loving character. He's still a little kind of kid inside. It's very strange to see this sort of aw shucks guy in a world where, you know, all these kids are so smart and wily, and yet you've got this, this sort of you know, Barney Fife wandering around, which is tremendously entertaining. Opposite Deputy Dewey was hyper-aggressive reporter Gail Weathers, who would stop at nothing to get what she wanted. Hi, Gail Weathers, reporting live from Woodward Police Station. We're talking about the Sydney press pod. Hey, watch it, Larry. Hey, watch the hand. You know what you're dealing with here? The character, Gail Weathers, is just a great, just a classic tabloid journalist. And no one felt Gail's sting more than her cameraman and resident flunky, Kenny Jones. He was Gail's chief whipping boy, you know, that uh, rolls downhill. And she was at the apex of the hill, and he was at the bottom. And finally, keeping a watchful eye on his students was the morally upright but slightly unhinged Principal Hembry. You make me so sick. Your entire habit-inducing, thieving, whoring generation disgusts me. Yeah, Principal Hembry and Sheriff Burke are uh, the only real present adults. Uh, the mother is uh, dead, uh, and the father is going off on a business trip, and uh, there really doesn't seem to be too many other parents around. I would imagine that the reason that her father is saying that he wants to leave town is to use uh, the character as a red herring. Have you located Sidney's father yet? Not yet. Well, he's not a suspect, is he? We haven't ruled him out as a possibility. Even with its cast of colorful characters and would-be suspects, and its knack for turning every cliché on its head, the question remained, could the horror movie make a comeback? But the horror genre was not really in vogue at that moment. They were seen as funny, they weren't so scary anymore, um, so people weren't really making them. I mean, horror was dead. Dead or not, one devoted horror movie fan decided it was time to take a gamble and write something that would defy expectations and break new ground. I was trying to create something new and different that we haven't seen before. I wanted it to sort of just be perverse and very sort of um, satirical, but very real. The resulting screenplay, originally titled Scary Movie, was indeed satirical, but its inspiration came from an event that was grisly, shocking, and most disturbingly, true. Scary night, isn't it? With the murders and all, it's like, by the mid-1990s, audiences had grown tired of the played-out formula of typical teen horror movies, popularized by lackluster sequels and inferior imitators. When even previously unstoppable horror icons such as Michael Myers, Jason Voorhees, and Freddy Krueger failed to deliver even modest box office returns, it seemed as if a staple of cinema just might fade into obscurity. Horror movies are a very specific genre and they tend to go in cycles of what's being done at any given time. Um, in the 80s, there was the slasher, and the slasher picture really became the kind of horror movie. Starting with Halloween, and then you had your Friday the 13th, your Nightmare on Elm Street, um, and then House on Sorority Row, and all those kinds of movies. Those movies had kind of played themselves out. The lead characters, the killers, were kind of being seen as uh, as a joke. They were seen as funny. They weren't so scary anymore. I'll get you, my pretty, and your little soul too. Ah! Maybe just that it was at a time when the horror genre was not doing very well. So people weren't really making them. No one was doing it. By the mid-90s, the horror genre was, was truly dead. It seemed as though the film industry and audiences were prepared to let the typical stock and slash horror film rest in peace. Against this backdrop, one devout fan of the genre, 25-year-old Kevin Williamson, was desperately seeking to gain a foothold in the film business. Kevin had been kind of in town working at 
you know, relatively minor writing jobs. This was sort of the beginning of his career. He wasn't, he hadn't written a lot of things before this. After struggling to find work as an actor in New York City, Kevin Williamson's first attempt at crafting a screenplay came after making the move to Hollywood in 1991, but it would take four long years before Williamson would get his first break as a writer. I read uh, Kevin's very first script, Killing Mrs. Tingle, which I just thought was remarkable. Great characters, amazing dialogue. He really had a gift. Although Killing Mrs. Tingle sold to independent production company Interscope Communications, it languished in development hell, leaving Williamson to wonder if the film would ever be produced. Because of this, he found himself struggling once again to find work in the highly competitive trenches of Hollywood. We were looking to find him a job off of the sale of Killing Mrs. Tingle, and the horror franchises that le had led up to that moment had all kind of petered out. They were all kind of fading away, so it wasn't exactly the sexiest thing to be out looking for a horror job. So in, that, in truth, we were having a hard time finding Kevin a great gig. To make ends meet, Kevin Williamson took a job house-sitting for a friend. It was this decision and his financially desperate situation that put him at the right place at the right time, allowing him to catch a news program about a very disturbing subject. He was house-sitting, and he was watching a TV special about real murders and uh, kind of started scaring himself as he was watching it. Williamson had a right to be scared as he sat alone in the quiet house, watching the very real story of an infamous Florida serial killer. A tale so terrifying and so unbelievable, it seemed like something right out of a scary movie. Between November 1989 and August 1990, Danny Rowling murdered five students in Gainesville, Florida. Local media dubbed him the Gainesville Ripper. Her body was also posed and her head was left on a shelf as though to shock whomever walked into the scene. Rowling would break into the apartments and dormitories of unsuspecting college students torturing, decapitating, sexually assaulting, and mutilating his victims, posing them grotesquely to highlight the chaos and carnage he had caused. The case had finally come together, and on November 15, 1991, Danny Rowling was indicted to stand trial as the Gainesville killer. The horrifying true story of the Gainesville Ripper was an eerie reminder to Williamson of his favorite fright film, Halloween, a bona fide genre classic. The tale of unstoppable killer Michael Myers had terrified Williamson as a 12-year-old child as much as it had inspired him. The great thing about Kevin is he'd seen every horror movie, and for him, Halloween was the seminal movie. You know, he loves Halloween, and he loves the genre, and he has that wicked sense of humor. He had called a friend, I guess, to kind of help him feel more relaxed. Instead, they ended up talking about scary movies and what's your favorite scary movie and all that. What's your favorite scary movie? Uh, I don't know. You have to have a favorite. What comes to mind? Um, Halloween. You know, the one with the guy in the white mask who walks around and stalks babysitters. And that was the genesis of what eventually became Scream. From that one frightening night, an idea for a new kind of horror movie was born. One that would rely on the conventions of the horror movies Williamson had loved as a boy. The story came to him quickly. And I went off um, to the desert for three days and locked myself in a room and I pounded it out. Literally went to Palm Springs and wrote the script for Scary Movie, which is remarkable. I thought someone else was gonna come along and make a scary movie or make a teenage movie and I'm gonna, you know, and I'm gonna have missed my chance. And there was another, even more compelling reason for his urgency. I was so desperate when I wrote it. I couldn't pay my bills, and my car payment was due, and, my, and I was three months behind on my rent. And he just let himself go and write it the way he thought, and I think that's always the, uh, the key to a really great script. Williamson took a gamble by crafting a screenplay that blended the cliches of his favorite horror movies with his own brand of dark humor. But would Hollywood respond to a scary movie that dared to mix in a healthy dose of comedy with its terror? Do you like scary movies, Sydney? In 1994, Kevin Williamson, a struggling actor turned screenwriter, conceived of a brand new idea for a horror film that would turn every genre cliche on its head. But even lifelong horror fan Williamson wasn't sure what Hollywood's reaction would be to his unconventional script. He was so nervous when he gave it to us because he thought for sure we were just gonna, you know, think that it was a dreadful idea and uh, 
and that uh, it was the worst timing in the world. But Williamson's innovative concept paid off. The script he was hoping would turn his life around was an immediate hit with those who read it. When I read the script, I thought, uh I thought it was brilliant. I think it was, you get a lot of scripts and, and they, they can take forever to read because they're dull or n not interesting, not original. And um, with Scream, it was a real page turner. And it was perfect. It was perfectly written. Right off the bat, it was really terrifying. It was so out of the blue, so unexpected to receive a script that good. Yeah, one of the things I loved about it when I first read it was it self-awareness. Sorry, that's the wrong answer. No, it's not. No, it's not. It was Jason. But at the same time, there was a real uh, humorous element. It didn't take itself too seriously. Then you should know Jason's mother, Mrs. Boris, was the original killer. Jason didn't show up until the sequel. I really wrote the script for the read because I wanted to sell it. I wanted people in Hollywood to go, oh, this is some cool dialogue. There's some cool characters. These are some cool plot twists. And it wasn't long before Hollywood responded. In terms of devising a strategy, we chose the smartest and best producers we could think of that could help to strengthen the project and in going into financiers. By the end of the day, there was four or five people bidding on it. Everyone else had called and said, we like it, we're gonna buy it, but we hadn't heard from Miramax yet. Williamson and his agents were hoping for a call from the boldest brothers of independent film, Bob and Harvey Weinstein, whose studio, Miramax Films, had already blazed a Hollywood trail with a string of Oscar-winning films, such as Pulp Fiction, The English Patient, and Sling Blade. As luck would have it, Bob Weinstein had recently begun a new upstart division that would focus solely on genre fare. He called his sister company, which had already acquired the rights to the Hellraiser and Halloween franchises, Dimension Films. I had told the people that were working for me the kind of movie that I was looking for, something that would be different than just the rest. And um, I had an assistant named Richard Potter. And I remember one day calling me up and says, I think I just read the script that you described. I called him and I said, Bob, I just read a script. If you don't want to make this movie, then I don't know what you're looking for. So he laughed and said, well, I guess I better read it then. And I read it and I loved it and I uh, bid uh, for it. But with other major suitors, such as Paramount, Universal, and Morgan Creek already circling the script, Dimension Films knew they had to get in the game fast. As the days went on, a bidding war drove the script's price higher and higher. And as the stakes rose, previously interested parties dropped out until only two players were left standing. The two produ production entities that emerged as the most competitive were Kerry Woods and Kathy Conrad on one side, and Dan Halstead and Oliver Stone on the other side. Surprisingly, the writer and director of high-profile films such as Platoon, Wall Street, and JFK had also decided he wanted to scoop up the hottest spec script in town. But it happened to be at a time when Williamson got the call he was waiting for. The next morning, it was like 9 o'clock in the morning, we got a call from Miramax. Say, you know, it's saying, okay, Bob read it, he loved it, he wants to buy it, how much? How much would become an important question when it came time to decide which buyer would ultimately make Scary Movie. There is a bidding war uh, that when our offer comes in, it is not as high as some of the other offers. And the decision to accept one of those offers could only come from Kevin Williamson. Bob understood it. Bob loved the genre. I mean, Halloween was one of his favorite movies. It was one of my favorite movies. We bonded instantly. He's like the uh, Quentin Tarantino of like filmology when it comes to every reference and every character that ever was in a horror movie. By acquiring the hottest spec script in town, Dimension Films solidified their future as a major player in the world of genre movies. It also changed Kevin Williamson's life forever with an initial check for $400,000 and the start of a career which would make him the new voice of a generation. Kevin really, really had his finger on the pulse of the modern American teenager. I'm gonna swing by the video store. I was thinking Tom Cruise and all the right moves. You know, if you pause it just right, you can see his penis. A lot of what Tatum said specifically, she brought a lot of the modern pop culture thing into it. And then obviously the Jamie Kennedy character, the Matthew Lillard character, the whole, these are very savvy, funny, witty kids. Kizu, kiss kizu, is easy. The dialogue in, in the Scream script was amazing. I mean, you read it, it just felt real or beyond real. You know, it felt like these kids were so smart and the fact that that was written and the fact that they were aware of horror movies. What movie is this from? I spit on your garage. I was home watching television the, uh, 
The Exorcist was on. What's that werewolf movie with E.T.'s mom in it? The Howling Horror Straight Ahead. Having officially made his entrance as a legitimate Hollywood player, everyone was buzzing about the hottest new screenwriter in town, a man who had found a niche that had been missing from the cinematic landscape for over a decade, a movie about teenagers and high school life that felt real, timely, and generation-specific. He took the John Hughes formula and the slasher formula and made it feel modern and contemporary. And the film itself definitely was sort of hip and, and um, focused towards a, a younger generation. Definitely felt like a John Hughes movie gone to hell. Those kids in the John Hughes movies felt like modern, contemporary kids. Nothing could shock me anymore. Last night at the dance, my little brother paid a buck to see her underwear. Oh, really, Alicia? As if. Come on, sporto. Level with me. Do you slip her the hot beef injection? Breasts. I want to see Jamie Lee's breast. When do yes. we see Jamie yes. Lee's breast? And I think perhaps uh, Scream became similar to one of those films. Kevin just has very literate characters who are talking about everything that's going on, and I think that's what made the script so appealing. She wants to kill herself, but she realizes that teen suicide is out this year, and homicide is a much healthier therapeutic expression. Where do you get this? Ricky Lake. Oh, you are pathetic. Kevin is the only one who can do that dialogue, and you believe it. Kevin really, really thought through everything. He really understood the structure and mythology of slasher films and red herring movies and just applied the John Hughes modern teenager to it. With a fresh take on an old genre, Dimension Films was ready to find a director for their horror hybrid. However, it began to seem as if Scary Movie would never get made when nearly every bankable horror director in town said no. Kevin Williamson's scary movie was a script that took Hollywood by storm, putting the hot young writer on the fast track to success. But the production faced a major hurdle, finding a director who could successfully blend the satirical elements of the screenplay with spine-tingling horror. And the first person that came into our minds was Wes Craven. I mean, when you think about the first Nightmare on Elm Street, if that's the only movie you watch, you see that this guy can scare you. He's got ways the best there is so I figured if we we're gonna make our first uh, dimension movie why not go with the best he was not interested in doing this which was a huge disappointment I passed and I passed for um, quite a while I know they had approached George Romero and Sam Raimi and you know kind of like the staples of of the horror world there's always another list of directors but you'd stare at that list and start crying i feel like we were kind of dragging our feet to a certain extent because we really wanted to get west to do it west wanted to do other things and it, for, it was it was a conversation as to whether or not he would go back and do horror i understand it. he didn't want to do quote another slasher movie with the talent pool shrinking fast the studio behind the project dimension films continued to hope that their director of choice would change his mind Wes Craven has influenced horror in the 70s with Last House on the Left, in the 80s with Nightmare on Elm Street. You cannot overstate how incredibly influential Wes Craven has been to the horror genre and has continually made movies for different generations that felt so contemporary. Craven's previous work, at times critically lauded, often shocking, but always provocative, reached mainstream success with 1984's A Nightmare on Elm Street. In it, he created one of the most iconic figures in all of modern horror, Freddy Krueger. Wes became horror meister Wes Craven, slasher director Wes Craven, and I became horror star, uh, slasher star Robert England. You know, and that, and that gets attached to your name for a while. Before long, Craven found himself firmly enmeshed in the world of horror movies, a place where he could use his talent at evoking blood-chilling terror to maximum effect. I read an interview with Wes once somewhere where he said, within the realm of horror movies, you can do anything you want. You can explore any issue you want. You just have to have a jump out and grab you every 10 minutes.
I think people would imagine because of the films that he makes that he uh, would be really twisted in some way. Of course, he is in some way. Um, but he's also uh, just a really lovely energy, really wonderful, really calm, um, a great director, a great leader, and people love to work with him. When you meet Wes, it's pretty, it's pretty shocking because you expect someone who's like a little creepier and he's so intelligent and soft-spoken and just kind because you're like, wow, you know, what's going on behind those sweet eyes that has such darkness and crazy? It was Craven's ability to take audiences to the dark side that kept him in the minds of Dimension executives, even though he had passed on the project more than once. I think the reason that I passed on it was my usual stupidity. You know, just I, I have this long, long career, long ambivalence towards doing genre films. And um, I don't want to sound like uh, I'm prissy, but there is an element to the genre that is uh, can be said to be misogynistic, for instance, and always carving up girls. And there's a part of me that feels like, how much longer do you want to do this? The answer came after a certain young movie star showed interest in the project a move which enticed Craven to seriously reconsider dipping his toe back into the bloody waters that made him famous. It was Bob that came to me and said, and I've got Drew Barrymore attached. I said, Drew Barrymore wants to be in a horror film? Just, she likes it. Getting Drew Barrymore in Scream was a huge deal. While Drew was obviously famous at the time um, and a star at the time, she had not yet become the megastar that she is now. Despite the attachment of Barrymore, Craven was still not so quick to dismiss his initial concerns. I think it was actually the opening section in the writing, just the, the sort of tormenting of a girl for 15 minutes and then having her killed and disemboweled. And I just said, when do I want to do this again? What's this going to do to my karma? In the end, it was the words of a young fan that solved the director's moral dilemma. A little kid, um, I think, 12 years old, somewhere around there, coming up to me and saying, you should do a real movie again because you've been doing, your movies are getting softer and softer. And that just stuck with me and I was, you know, look, you've been fighting this whole career, but the movies you've made that have really been important have crossed the boundaries of decency and are scary because they are ruthless. And I called up Bob Weinstein and I said, you know, if that job is still open, I'll take it. We, you know, sat down and over a period of time um, I think he came to see what it could be. Drew Barrymore played a big role in getting Wes to take another look at the project and see what it really was. He said yes, and we were all thrilled, and it took off. When he came on board, we knew. We knew we had something. With a genre-bending script, a Hollywood starlet in the lead, and their first-choice director officially on board, the film was finally beginning to take shape. Everything seemed to be going according to plan, until the day Drew Barrymore came up with a radical idea, one that was either uniquely inspired or one that could completely derail the project. The question now became, would Wes Craven's scary movie ever see the light of day? Don't worry, you'll find out soon enough, I promise. In 1995, screenwriting newcomer Kevin Williamson wrote a script that combined teenagers, terror, and humor in a way no one had before, attracting upstart genre studio Dimension Films, and after a few false starts, famed horror director Wes Craven. With the key elements in place behind the camera, Craven's next goal was to cast the movie with stars plucked from the world of film and television. But first, the production had to deal with a major blow. Drew Barrymore, the star who was attached to play the lead role of Sydney, had a last minute and very unexpected change of heart. At about five or six weeks of, till we were to shoot uh, in prep, she changed her mind. What does she want to do? She wants to just be in the opening. I remember Drew actually telling us, the audience will think, because I'm Drew Barrymore, that I'll survive this movie and I get killed in the first, you know, five minutes of the film. We were not happy uh, at all, but, you know, we were on board. And I almost said, okay, that's it, I'm out of here. I think for a minute there, Wes thought about quitting. But he didn't quit. Rather, Craven and his team adjusted to Barrymore's bold new idea. She loved that opening sequence. You never told me your name. Why do you want to know my name? I want to know who I'm looking at. It was such a canny decision. She worked for five days, and she made a niche in cinematic history for her genre films in that five days of incredible work. 
And even though Drew Barrymore would no longer be playing the lead, the producers and Wes Craven quickly realized that losing their star didn't mean losing her star power. With Drew being attached, that's really what got the rest of the cast into it. The phones were ringing off the hook. Everybody wanted to be in this movie. So our casting sessions were fantastic. They were great. Those early casting sessions would begin with the search for an actress to fill Barrymore's shoes in the role of the film's heroine, Sidney Prescott, a character that combined intelligence and strength with real vulnerability. It goes back to, you know, the classic Scream Queen. I mean, Sigourney Weaver and Alien, Jamie Lee Curtis and Halloween. There is a numerous other actresses that they had screen tested. Alicia Wood came in, Brittany Murphy came in. Reese Witherspoon never actually came in, but her name was certainly in consideration. The role of Sydney would ultimately go to an actress who'd already cast a spell over teen audiences in the 1996 cult favorite, The Craft, and who is currently a staple on a hit weekly television show. And I remember Ned was on Party of Five. You know, that show was really starting to blow up. The camera pans to a desk against the wall where Sydney Prescott, a young girl of 17, sits, her face glued to the computer monitor in front of her. I was at a place in my career was very new. You know, I, I had done Party of Five and, and that had hit in the first year and I'd done the craft. She just had a perfect combination of the innocence that you needed but the strength uh, of, of that girl who was gonna be able to When we saw Nev Campbell, it, there was no question. So who are you? The question isn't who am I? The question is where am I? So where are you? <sighs> Your front porch. Scream was really the first lead that I'd been up for in a film and was called in and did a big audition um, and I think I had several callbacks. That's enough sub bucket out of here. <laughs> do you see what you do to me? Do you know what my dad will do to you? You just believed her as this teenage girl, this vulnerable teenage girl. Everyone in the room when we watched it was like, that's Sydney. With the film's lead in place, it was time to round out the rest of the cast, starting with Sydney's boyfriend, the charming yet broodingly mysterious Billy Loomis. The Billy Loomis character, his name even is a tip of the hat to the Halloween movies, which were a big influence on Kevin. Sam Loomis is the character that Donald Pleasance played in the Halloween movies. So we're looking at the part of Billy. It was so hard to find the perfect, you know, handsome guy. There suddenly was this buzz about this kid named Skeet Ulrich. He reminded us, he reminded Wes certainly of when he cast Johnny Depp in Nightmare on Elm Street. <laughs> Totally nailed it. There was just no question. He was Billy. He was fabulous. He was the hot young guy, and you look back now, and his performance is pitch perfect. Sheriff, I didn't kill anybody. And all the girls went crazy. All, that's how you can tell. Every girl is turning red and sweating. Norman Bates have a motive? Nope. And did they really ever explain why Hannibal Lecter liked to eat people? Don't think so. You see, it's scarier when there's no motive, Sid. I knew that he, he was really like a hot New thing in Hollywood. He was the hot ingenue, if I can say that scheme. Next in the casting lineup was Sydney's loyal best friend, Tatum Riley. I had seen Rose McGowan at the Sundance Film Festival that year in a movie called The Doom Generation, and I was just so mesmerized with her. From behind, a finger taps her shoulder. She spins around to see Tatum Riley, same age, feisty, carefree. I think Tatum was very glib, but at the same time, she had a real sweetness, like in the scene in her bedroom. Bam! Sid! Super Rose is so feisty and her character Tatum so feisty. Yeah, I think she was just funny. I mean, I think she was just going for the laugh. Even with other contenders, such as television actresses Rebecca Gayhart and Melinda Clark vying for the role, there was little doubt in the minds of the filmmakers as to who they would cast. We did look a lot of people for that part, um, and in the end there really was just no question because she totally embodied, you know, what Tatum needed to be. Rose manages to be cute and hot at the same time. Finding the right actor for the pivotal role of Stu Mocker, Tatum's beau and Billy's best friend, proved to be a case of a young actor being at the right place at the right time. The day that Matthew Lillard came in, he happened to be across the hall with his girlfriend who was working with another casting director. And I looked at him and I said, um, you look good for this part. Would you mind coming in and auditioning, please? Next to Tatum sits her boyfriend, Stuart, with his arms draped across her back. He's a Billy wannabe. Almost the jock, almost handsome, almost cool. He tries way too hard. <laughs> Stu was with me last night, okay? Yeah, it was. 
I go back and watch that. I'm like, first of all, I weigh 80 pounds. Second of all, I spit my way through the whole thing. And that vein that runs through my forehead is terrifying. I mean, that alone should have just automatically kicked me out of Hollywood in general. Rounding out the lineup of suspects and soon-to-be victims was uber geek and resident horror film fanatic Randy Meeks. He's the Joker, the wild card. And he's the one that you can't quite figure out, and he can comment on everybody because he's slight, just slightly outside the group. Across the table is a fifth wheel Randy, a tall and gangly kid with no such Billy-like aspirations. A witty jokester who elevates geek to coolness. Did you really put her liver in the mailbox? Because I heard that they found her liver in the mailbox next to her spleen and her pancreas. At the time, I was a very struggling actor, and I said, I got to get in for this movie. It was just one of those moments where we'd seen a lot of people for this role for Randy, and we just didn't know where we were going. And I get a call from my agent. She goes, hey, um, it's not bad. It was between him and Breck and Meyer, but just, you know, it was just that certain something that, that got him the part instead of Breck and Meyer. And three, never, ever, ever, under any circumstances say, uh, I'll be right back. I love Breck and Meyer, but Jamie Kennedy really owned that part. Thank you. With the main teen cast now in place, the producers began their search for the right actors to portray the film's adult characters, beginning with Tatum's bumbling older brother, Deputy Dewey Riley. Oh, Dewey. A young officer looks at the clipboard. This is Deputy Riley, better known as Dewey. He's a big guy, 20s, handsome in a scrub clean boyish way. Damn it, Dewey. Well, what did Mama tell you? When I wear this badge, you treat me like a man of the law. That's one of my favorite aspects of Dewey, is that he's in a position of power, but no one gives him respect. You know, I always think in, in Dewey's mind, I always think like he thinks he's kind of clean, Clint Eastwood. Like, you know, he thinks he's really cool, but then, you know, nobody else does. The whole David thing was very interesting because he was, we, we offered him a role of one of the kids. I read it and um, I came in and I said, uh, Wes, I, I really would, rather uh, do the role of Dewey. And he was like, Dewey? Well, why would you want to do that role? It's like, well, I do get to kiss Courtney Cox. And <laughs> if I may say so, Miss Weathers, you are much prettier in person. I took a chance on this guy who wants it so much. So Dewey became kind of the heart of the movie. Playing the yin to Dewey's yang was Gail Weathers, a cynical TV journalist and a difficult role to cast until a television star surprised everyone and lobbied hard to get the role. We probably offered the role of Gail to Janine Garofalo and she passed on it. We also were very close to hiring Brooke Shields and then um, we met Courtney. I wanted to play the part of Gail Weathers because she was just a total and it was something that I hadn't got to play um, in a while, at least being on Friends for so long. She was the hottest thing coming off of Friends. I mean, for her to be in a movie like this was a very big deal because people were really used to seeing her on the number one show. And I had to really do some persuading to get the part because they didn't really see me as a If I'm right about this, I could save a man's life. Do you know what that could do for my book sales? And working under power-hungry Gail Weathers was her much put upon cameraman, Kenny Jones. Jumping from the driver's seat is Kenny, Gail's cameraman and flunky, an earnest young chap on the chubby side. I was kind of in decent shape before the film, and there's all these fat jokes about Kenny, so I purposefully put on 20 pounds. Kenny? Yeah? I know that you're about 50 pounds overweight, but when I say hurry, please interpret that as move your fat tub of lard it was trying to make him likable and, and that the audience has some empathy for him. With the majority of the cast now in place, there was just one more important role to fill, that of the maniacal killer. But this time, it wouldn't really matter what the actor looked like. The killer in Wes Craven's latest movie would be known for something that almost every slasher icon before never had, a voice. And to keep the terror real, that voice belonged to a man the cast, even to this day, has never seen. If you hang up on me, you'll die just like your mother. With casting for Wes Craven's new horror film nearly complete, the search was on to fill the final critical role, that of the masked knife-wielding killer. Like many of the murderers from horror movies past, Ghostface would be played on screen by a Hollywood stuntman. 
but the threatening voice of the killer would be brought to life by another unseen actor. Do you want to die, Sydney? Roger Jackson, the perfect voiceover artist. His voice is just creepy and menacing enough. You hear that voice, it still gives you chills. I was hired to play the scene with Drew Barrymore. And the intention at that time was that I was going to play the scenes and they would dub a voice in later. And I think Roger brought a real intelligence and, you know, creepiness, probably much more intelligent than we had planned on. It was not only his intelligence and creepiness that won the veteran voice actor the role, but his ability to completely terrify the actors he was playing against. In truth, though Jackson only played the voice of the killer, he actually was on set and on the phone during each take, but kept completely hidden from the actors, which only added to the character's frightening mystique. Well, that's actually an interesting thing. Wes did not let the actors see who was doing the voice. It was always a point to keep us separate because my job is to frighten them during the filming. There is no monster as frightening as the one you create in your own imagination. I think it was really great choice of Wes's to not have any of the actors actually meet Roger uh, because I think it helped us all to stay in character and not be so familiar with him as a person. The question is, who am I? The question is, where am I? But it wasn't just physical proximity to his on-screen victims that made Ghostface menacing. It was his voice, cleverly enhanced by an electronic handheld device that further allowed the killer to disguise his identity. Called Guess How I'm Gonna Die! The voice box was, one, again, one of the smartest, most clever gimmicks, because that, hello, Sydney. It's, it's kind of in Saw, you hear, I want to play a game. I want to play a game. The idea that anyone could be the killer but just by putting on the costume and using the voice box was so scary, because you didn't know who it was. The next step in the creation of Ghostface was to find the right look to match the menacing voice. A task which seemed simple enough, but became a source of creative frustration for the filmmakers and effects artists. The script just says Ghostface. We had no idea what that looks like. Okay, that's a fantastic on the page, but how do you translate that into something visual? Wes had to shoot the movie, so obviously it came into his mind, what does this guy look like? Even some of the most gifted special effects artists in Hollywood were at a loss to find the right face for the film's iconic killer. I know that uh, they had a lot of people drawing pictures of scary things, you know, witches, goblins, monsters, vampires, and they would send them to Wes. Either Wes liked them or didn't like them. I remember we had our first production meeting, and I took all the sketches with me and showed Wes, and, and he's like, ah, maybe this one, but I don't know. So we had our art department making up masks, and we're getting closer and closer to the time to shoot. Everything that we saw just didn't look good. It wasn't right. It didn't carry any weight. Just none of them, to me, looked like the right mask. Once again, it was being at the right place at the right time that presented Craven with a solution. So we were scouting, and we ended up sh uh, scouting in the house where they shot Shadow of a Doubt. In that house is where I found the ghost face. There's a woman who was older, and her kids were grown up and had moved out. And I went upstairs, it was like her son's bedroom, and the ghost mask was sitting there. So we took the mask and we sent it to Dimension Films, and they said, uh, okay, we like that, so have your guys make one kind of like that, because we don't own it. And he brought it to us and said, this is what I think I want it to be. We sculpted all different versions, like one with longer chin, one with a furrowed brow, one with bigger eye sockets, one with smaller eye sockets, one with broader face. We sculpted and re-sculpted and re-sculpted and re-sculpted. And none of the masks were looking good. You know, they just didn't have what that mask had. And I think I must have seen maybe seven different versions of it before we came to the final, but there's something about the design that is really striking and really shocking when it comes up against you. The thing about it is it just happens to be so archetypal. Many people compare it to Edvard Munch's The Scream. It has a mournful sadness that's almost dreamlike. It was like a love affair with that, with that mask. I mean... And it has struck everybody that sees that mask has been drawn to it. With the look of the mask finally settled upon, the next step was to find a suitable costume for Ghostface. There is no description of what the killer is wearing. So take the mask out of your mind and you have a guy. 
Wes spent a lot of time talking to us about what do we think he's wearing. We went a long way down the road with, a, with white robes, because it was a ghost, supposedly. Does he look like Casper? And obviously, you know, you put a guy in white with a white mask, you don't want him to look like he's in the Klan either. So what's he going to look like? So we discussed with a costume designer at the time, and we came up with a black costume. It had a little bit of sheen to it and sparkle so that it would catch the light. It was quickly discovered that the costume also needed to serve a vital plot function. So we came up with the idea of covering the whole body, covering the hands, covering the feet, um, because it also had to kind of be a couple different people. So it actually got down to covering every square inch of the killer with this costume that we devised. The main thing we were worrying about was just, were people going to buy the ghost as anybody? And I think they totally do. There is this kind of supernatural killer in a way. I mean, ghost face, he can fall out windows almost like Michael Myers and walk away and uh, not a scratch. There's never a bruise on the face from the fights this ghost face gets in. The face, somebody, anybody can put that on, which may, I think is one of the things that makes the Scream movie scarier, is that it could be anybody. And they're using this, this persona, this you know white, blank, ghost face, emotionless thing as this uh, way to uh, rip you to pieces. Underneath the mask, underneath the monster that is out there, that horrible ghost face killer is us. And I think that is, to me, the most important thing that we all have to do as human beings is stop externalizing evil and look inside of ourselves. I am the darkness that exists in the mind of all people. I am not one person. I exist across the spectrum of the human psyche and I will find a way to you. With a cast, a killer, and a crew ready to go, everyone looked forward to the first day of shooting in the bucolic Northern California town of Santa Rosa. But actors and crew members who thought the peaceful surroundings meant a trouble-free shoot were in for a major surprise when all hell broke loose over the script and the filmmakers found themselves in the middle of a political firefight. In the spring of 1996, Studio Dimension Films and veteran horror director Wes Craven were ready to bring Kevin Williamson's genre-bending screenplay Scary Movie to life. But first, they needed to find the right location to stand in for the film's pastoral community of Woodsboro, the place where all of the movie's terror would be unleashed. The location of where the film was to be shot was, um, I thought, critical. And we went up to the wine country and Scott did. It was back when I was thinking, as a loyal Californian, I have to shoot in California. Miramax wanted to do this movie for $15 million, and they didn't want to do it in California. It was going to be too expensive. And I said, well, we want you to shoot in Vancouver because it's going to save us a million dollars. It's a beautiful place, but it's not American. And then we went to Santa Rosa, and, you know, it's all there. It seemed all, it just fit. You know, the Hillsburg Town Square, the small town atmosphere, the houses. And it was one of those times where I've taken uh, kind of a tough stand. And I remember going to Bob's office in New York and saying, I, um, I think this is very important. And somebody in Bob or Harvey's office said, that's fine, instead of Wes Craven's scary movie. We'll just do Joe Blow's scary movie. You know? Okay, there goes a great job. And one of the Weinsteins said, all right, that's, his name is worth $3 million. Go get him. And went back up and he said, well, if it's that important, okay, fine. <laughs> no, so it was that close. With the location dispute behind him, Wes Craven began scouting in the picturesque Northern California wine country, finally settling on the beautiful town of Santa Rosa. For Craven and his team, one location in particular caught their attention. There was a beautiful high school in Santa Rosa that they seemed to be very film friendly. Santa Rosa High School had actually been used in film before. It's the high school in Francis Ford Coppola's Peggy Sue Got Married. And that was one of the big selling points about going to Santa Rosa was, well, here we have this high school and it seems perfect. It seems the best for production. I wanted very much that very, very American feel to it. So that's how we ended up there. But the reception the filmmakers received was not as inviting as the location's rolling green hills. Although the high school's administration had initially welcomed the cast and crew, it was the Santa Rosa City School Board that had the final say, and they were less than enthused. The principal and everybody else there was extremely excited about it, so that was totally a positive experience. So we went weeks and weeks into pre-production, and then very close to the time we were going to shoot, the school board 
said, oh, wait a minute, you got to shoot there, let us read the script. When we had our first presentation, we were told that it was a, a spoof, a comedy, and what we read was not. They read the script and uh, were completely affronted by it, just thought it was despicable and uh, should not be allowed in their high school and, and pulled the contract. The board had an opinion at the time. They didn't really want to glorify um, violence against children. And you have to remember, that was a sensitive period of time for Sonoma County. The production's timing coincided with the tragedy of Polly Class, a case that gained national attention. On October 1st, 1993, 12-year-old Polly was kidnapped at knife point from her mother's home during a slumber party. She was later found murdered, having been strangled by her abductor, Richard Allen Davis. And the trial was just starting against uh, uh, Davis, who was the uh, murderer. Uh, this was had a great impact upon uh, the feelings of our community, and there was a lot of raw nerves about it, as I recall. And basically what they did is they had a big town hall, and everyone was allowed to say their piece. And so one citizen after the other would come up and give their opinion as to whether or not we should shoot there. It was a vocal crowd that greeted school district directors tonight, along with not one, but two long lines of people ready to comment on the controversy. The entire scientific community has reached a consensus that violent viewing, viewing is harmful for people. It's harmful for you, most harmful for young people. It's harmful Those for people. opposed to the movie cited the violence expected to be associated with the horror flick as a reason for banning the film crew from campus. The thing that needs to be understood though is the decision to not allow the uh, Wes Craven production here was not based on people's views of morality or the content of his film. It was based on the disruption of the educational program and then they voted, and they voted us out. In retrospect, I can understand the, the trauma that was on that, that area because of, uh, of that case, but uh, they were very harsh. We were treated like scum. I, I don't, don't draw any judgment upon his work. I think he's a talented and brilliant guy. It's just a game we didn't want to play, and we weren't interested in pursuing it. I did put in the, uh, in the end credits, and no thanks whatsoever <laughs> to the center. Rose the school board. I guess he got his last word in on us, and uh, you know, maybe appropriately so. Craven and his crew ultimately solved their location issue when they were invited to shoot the film's high school sequences at a local community center in the neighboring town of Sonoma. It had been a high school, and it didn't fall into the jurisdiction of any of the school boards, um, so we could pay to use it, and that ended up being the high school. And we put the big sign, Woodboro sign up over the thing and put some lockers in the hallways. The next location to lock down was to be the home of Tatum and Dewey Riley, which turned out to be near two other homes that had already earned their own film pedigree. Across the street from Tatum's house, uh, Rose McGowan's house was uh, the Pollyanna house. And then next door, Across the side street is the house that was used in Alfred Hitchcock's Shadow of a Doubt. With its filming locations finally secured, production of Wes Craven's scary movie officially began on April 15th, 1996. Action! The first uh, five days of photography in Scream was the opening Drew Barrymore sequence. The character Casey was, you were so with her, making her jiffy pop and home alone. She's vulnerable, she thinks she's safe because she's in her home. That whole opening with, with Drew was meant to start in a completely innocent way and get heavier and heavier and heavier. And I love the elements that sort of tied it to, you know, when a stranger calls that creepy guy on the phone. Why haven't you checked the children? It's something of a cultural icon. All you have to say is, We've traced the call. It's coming from inside the house. And everyone would know what you were talking about. But the idea that you could now do that to somebody with a cell phone and that they're wandering around your house looking at you was terrifying. Like the frightening film that inspired it, the terror threatening the young girl was just a phone call away. And voice actor Roger Jackson's job was to provide the menace that would make Drew Barrymore's performance seem very, very real. It's my job to try and scare the hell out of them. A lot of what she did at, at full tilt, uh, screaming, running around on her bare feet, that was all for real. She found it. She brought it. I mean, people thought, well, Drew Barrymore is going to be in the whole film. And it suddenly was this almost a psycho switch where he just dispenses of her so quickly. I cried when, you know, Drew Barrymore gets stabbed. I thought her performance was magnificent. It was so powerful. And did such an amazing job with it. 
such a great time working with her that uh, you know, it turned out to be one of the best things on my reel, so to speak. But despite Wes Craven's confidence, he still had to prove his vision of the film to the studio. I know as those dailyers were coming in, there was concern in part of the studio that it wasn't going to be scary, that it wasn't being um, shot the way they had hoped it would have been shot. I know they were putting all sorts of pressure on Wes and everything like that. And in Hollywood parlance, that means you're about to be fired. There was a lot of things in the beginning that were, that could have made the ship sink. Bob hated the ghost mask. And we shot the entire Drew Barrymore scene with it. I didn't think that uh, the audiences would be scared about it, but it uh, shows you what I know. It's difficult, you know, because you have a lot of cooks in the, in the kitchen. So the filmmakers set out to prove to the studio the opening sequence and the look of the film's ghost-faced killer would indeed work. We immediately cut it as fast as we could and sent 13 minutes of work print to Bob Weinstein and uh, to mention films in New York. I believe their immediate response was, oh my God, we were so wrong, this is brilliant. Whatever you need, everything changed based on that opening 13 minutes. It, it's really a testament to Wes. I mean, having a strong vision, and he really put himself out there. With the first scenes complete, Wes Craven led his cast and crew onward, but nothing could prepare them for what would end up being the longest, most grueling, and bloodiest night in horror movie history. Stop right there. In the spring of 1996, production on Scary Movie was moving forward, despite a bitter fight with the local school board over permission to film in the local high school. In addition, actress Drew Barrymore had opted out of playing the lead role, choosing instead to portray the slasher film's first on-screen victim. While these hurdles were behind them, director Wes Craven and his team faced yet another challenge, shooting the film's climactic and blood-drenched 42-minute finale. Yeah, that was the scene, uh, from, the scene from hell. It was um, essentially the whole third act. So it began with the party at the house, at Stu's house. And uh, since it didn't change locations, it all was lumped under, you know, scene 118A, B, C, D, up through the alphabet. That just became kind of a joke that we survived scene 118. It was called People Live, People Die. It just kind of seemed endless that we were up at this house and just night after night, that was where, you know, Billy and, and, and Sid made love. That was where uh, Randy gave his rules of horror. That was where Dewey and Gail showed up. And it just went on and on and on. We were at that location forever. Shot over a grueling 21-night schedule, the film's last act would see the end of many of its most memorable characters, beginning with Sidney's loyal best friend, Tatum. It was wet every night, cold, wet. And Rose McGowan, she was, she was cold. And to this day, I get asked if I had some sort of a prosthetic in my chest, which I didn't even know was possible. I had no idea what was going on, but it became very popular with boys. Her breasts were very, very taut. It was cold there when we were shooting. I mean, it was, it was very nipply. I know, good, huh? But McGowan had more pressing concerns, such as her character's impending death scene. It was really fun killing Rose McGowan, but the only problem is she said she couldn't scream. So that took a lot of work, because she was getting killed in the garage door. They actually had to nail me to the inside of the garage door so I wouldn't fall through. And I had bruises from hanging and like screaming and going up and down and up and down. I did find that I can, in fact, fit through doggy doors. She got through. It was amazing. She got much farther through than we thought she would. Also amazing, at least to the actors in hindsight, was the fact that no one, including Tatum's own brother, Deputy Dewey, seemed to acknowledge poor Tatum's untimely demise. I feel quite badly that Dewey was never sad about Tatum's death. I mean, I obviously should have mourned the death of my sister. What a cold... <laughs> that happened later in the hospital room. What do you mean she's gone? The next to find himself at the mercy of Ghostface was Kenny the cameraman. That was the day my wife first came to visit. And then I remember my neck was cut open. And, oh, yeah, by the way, and threw my head back and just my neck gapes open. And it, it, it freaked her completely out uh, that it was that realistic, you know, up close. And while the casualties on screen were gory and dramatic, the unexpected loss of a key behind the scenes player was, for some, just as shocking. I would like to say that I survived scene 118. But in fact, that was on the last week of shooting, and I was fired. We went to work one day, and Mark wasn't there. And it's kind of funky that they would just 
let the DP go and nobody says a word. I don't really know totally what happened. I think him and Wes probably had creative differences. Now, I have no idea what the, the, the backstory was with the studio, with Harvey, with Bob, with Wes, but I do know when we saw dailies that night, Wes turned around and said to me, all this footage is out of focus. There were certain issues with focus and things being discussed. Wes and Marianne come from another room and said, here's what we want you to do. We want you to fire your camera crew, all those people, the dolly grip, and that's what the solution will be. And sometimes the head of the department is, will go, go, go to the lengths of saying, well, if you're going to get rid of them, you're going to get rid of me too. And I said, why don't you get a new DP as well? Problem is, when you say that, you better be prepared for people to take you up on it. And they said, you know what? Good idea. <laughs> I don't get it. I don't know what the problem is. All this footage and all the footage that I shot in the film is still in the movie. Well, that was my last night shooting on screen. With only a few days left of shooting, a new director of photography, Peter Deming, was brought in to finish the picture. Now, Craven and his crew prepared to deliver the film's final revelation, the unmasking of Ghostface and the shocking reveal of the killer's identity. I thought the reveal was, was brilliant. I think it was unexpected for audiences. It's one of those moments where you want to just walk up to the writer and shake his hand and go, you've done something no one thought of before. I mean, I've sat in a full audience of, of that movie and was blown away by hearing people trying to figure out who it was. You know, I, I think when you watch a film like this, it's the whodunit, and, and most often you, you're just trying to figure out who the one person is. The great red herring is that, of course, there's not one killer. There are two. Surprise, Sydney. That's why he can be in all these places at once, because it's two people. So I thought the twist at the end was very good. Why are you doing this? Don't play the game, Sydney. It's called Guess How I'm Gonna Die! I always thought of it as Captain Hook and Smee in Peter Pan. You know, you have this devilish kind of leader who's charismatic and beautiful and everyone, you know, follows him, but he's got this little sidekick and he'll do anything. They have this sort of dynamic duo quality. Uh, you know, uh, Skeet's character, Billy, is definitely the, the mastermind of the operation. I think, you know, Matthew Lillard's character is probably in love with him and is willing to do anything he's, he, and he says. I mean, they're maniacal, ruthless killers. I mean, they're pretty terrifying. If you look at the given circumstances, you know, you're hacking people apart, you're hanging people from trees, you're killing them in a garage door. You just couldn't believe the level of insanity. They were truly scary. It was just one intense scene after the other, you know, culminating with Billy, Stu, and Sid in, in the kitchen, and the guys stabbing each other, and everybody covered, covered in blood. I distinctly have these visions of myself and Nev and Skeet sitting in corners with blood, you know, you're covered in blood. And you start the night, you know, with covered in blood, and you finish the night with the sun coming up covered in blood. I was covered in corn syrup for, for weeks on end. <laughs> just got a bit old and disgusting. Plus it was freezing, so it's like sticky, freezing blood. And Wes is, Wes is like, well, one of his main quotes almost on every movie is, more blood! More blood! Don't be stingy! He's always saying more blood. But the bloodiest scene was yet to come with the climactic showdown between Sydney and the two killers as they revealed their murderous motive. That's too, I think she wants a motive. Hmm. Here they start to reveal the motive, which um, there were two camps when I sold the script, who felt one, one camp felt that there should be no motive. It feels scarier without one. I don't really believe in motive, Sid. I mean, did Norman Bates have a motive? No. Did they ever really decide why Hannibal Lecter liked to eat people? Don't think so. And then another group of people felt that there should be a motive. Your slight mother was my father. She's the reason my mom moved out and abandoned me. So I took that note, and the end result was both. I think the stuff at the end with Matthew and Skeet is, is, is pretty gratuitous. There's a lot of blood in the fact that they're, you know, stabbing each other. Ah! Scale one to ten. They're freaks. You know, they're, they're a ten. What was that great line? Movies don't create psychos. Movies make psychos for creative. You know, you were basically setting up that all rules were off.
we know these rules too, we're not going to do them, and if we do them, we're now very, very aware that we're doing them. I think that was pretty genius of Kevin to turn, turn horror on, its, on itself in a way um, and bring those things up and then include them in, in the film. So the audience, oh, I know what's going to happen, and then they don't know what's going to happen. They're all the same. Some stupid killer stalking some big-breasted girl who can't act who's always running up the stairs when she should be going out the front door. It's insulting. Of course, then, when the killer attacks, she does exactly that. And I think there's also something fun about audience members sitting and watching someone do something really stupid and going, no, don't do it, don't jump up, <laughs> don't go up the stairs. And, and um, so I think it was fun for us to actually admit that and then carry it through. Kevin was, was brazen about it. He drew your attention directly to those tropes. Knowing what all the cliches are and standing all of them on their heads. Who's there? Watch scary movies. It's a death wish. They've been around for so long, and characters that started doing the same thing over and over again. Don't go outside. No, it's a weird sound. I have to go outside and get killed, you know? Is anybody out there? Is somebody there? You guys doing something I shouldn't see? Basically, in all the horror movies up until that point, when you say that stuff, you get killed. No genre cliche seems safe from this scary movie, with the film even shattering what may be the most infamous of slasher movie rules. You never make love in a horror film. Don't have sex, that's one of the rules. Like, if you have sex, then you're going to die. Like, the, you, if you want to stay alive, just don't have sex with anybody. The character does a lot of the things that the film claims she shouldn't do and if she's going to survive, and then and then goes ahead and does them and does survive. And the fact that, you know, the moment that Sydney figures out, or I think she's figured out who the killer is, is the moment right after she has sex. Although Sidney Prescott would ultimately prevail over her homicidal tormentors, the film would find time to turn one more horror cliche on its head. Careful. This is the moment when the supposedly dead killer comes back to life for one last scare. Not in my movie. Most horror movies, most movies with a killer, you cannot kill the killer, but the cops always die. My character was supposed to die in the first one. Sidney? We liked David's portrayal of Dewey so much that we brought him back. And we all kind of looked at each other and said, we'd be really stupid if we didn't film a shot of Dewey coming out being alive. And so we did. We stuck it on the last day of shooting there. And I was like, really, wow. And then it's completely changed my life. That decision on the set at that time is just kind of uh, unbelievable. Having survived a grueling 21-night shoot in what many cast and crew dubbed the longest night in horror history, the film finally wrapped on June 8, 1996, much to the delight and relief of Craven, his crew, and especially the cast. I think by the end of it, we were all very relieved to be finished. I think the actors went out and literally put all their wardrobe in a pile and burned it. And we had t-shirts made, I survived C-118. <laughs> Although the cast was set free and most of the crew had survived scene 118, the director's battles were far from over. When the MPAA, Hollywood's Film Rating Association, weighed in, Craven was blindsided yet again, this time in the form of an NC-17 rating, a feature film's kiss of death. In the summer of 1996, after 40 days of shooting and overcoming location setbacks, last minute casting changes, and the filming of one of the longest and bloodiest slasher movie finales in recent memory, production wrapped on the genre-bending horror film, Scary Movie. But director Wes Craven would find himself embroiled in yet another contentious battle over his film, this time with the ratings board of the Motion Picture Association of America. Screen, out of the gate, no one knew what it was, so they came down on it. When we were going through the MPAA challenges on screen, which were sort of rampant, I think we had to go back nine times. It's very, very lengthy, very expensive, and the MPAA can say, OK, we're going to look at it again in two weeks and you're screwed. The MPA is always, you know, is always after us. It's always the worst thing in the world for a director to cut anything. Although Craven initially refused to cut anything from his movie, Dimension Films could not afford to gamble on an NC-17 rating. So we had a little bit of a battle with Bob Weinstein because obviously they don't want to put a movie out as an NC-17. Um, so Wes lost that battle. And we ended up making some cuts. It's hard when you don't get your rating to understand why 
Is it too much blood? Is it too much gore? Well, look, let's, let's speak frankly. I think, you know, genre films, horror films, slasher films are about human beings doing cruel and horrible things to each other. I can remember when Wes had to go back and take some frames out of Kenny's death scene because they said the look on my face was too, too disturbing and it had to be trimmed. And Wes's argument was, it's murder. It should be disturbing. Probably the most gratuitous things in the movie are the, the boyfriend, the gutted boyfriend. Oh, God! And one of the things they objected to was the fact as he sat there, his guts became victim to gravity and shifted and fell. Tatum's death uh, was one of the big MPA challenges. Uh, we, we went back several times on that and how much we could show if we're actually getting crushed in the garage door. <laughs> And they essentially were telling us that the entire scene 118, you know, especially Bill and Stu in the kitchen, was just too bloody and it had to be taken out of the picture. And it, it would have killed the picture. Can't you come I think I'm dying here, man. And there was a shot of Stu, Stu's hand sort of hanging down and blood was dripping off it. And I think the MPA said, okay, that's moving blood. We don't allow moving blood, so cut that short. So we cut that short. But Craven's cuts did not land him any closer to getting the R rating he needed. It went on for weeks, and you're always in a situation where your budget is disappearing, you're at the end of post-production, you've got the thing whole, you're usually in mix, so you've, all the editing is done, and now you're fighting this thing and they're asking for changes. Every change is every single department has to go back and redo all their tracks. It was back and forth and Wes was writing letters and um, phone calls and what would it take to actually be able to get the rating. And with the film's December release date right around the corner, it seemed as if Craven would need a Christmas miracle. And we were getting nowhere. So what happened is Bob Weinstein made a call to MPAA as the head of the studio. And the next thing I knew, we had an R rating. I think that when we expressed to them, please watch it again, understand the context of how this is happening, that it was, that there was an element of humor in it. And I said, Bob, what did you say to them? And he said, I told him it's a comedy. It's a comedy, it's a satire. Now, obviously, it's a, it's a um, intense situation, but it wasn't worthy of uh, the rating they wanted to give it. And that made all the difference. So uh, every film I'm gonna make from now on, I'm gonna say it's a comedy. <laughs> And indeed, Scary Movie had plenty of comedy. Kevin Williamson's in-jokes and pop culture references set it apart from other horror films being released at the time. And you can only hear that Richard Gere gerbil story so many times before you have to start believing it. And suddenly the audience went nuts because that was this crazy urban legend that everyone had heard. Obviously, it was very politically incorrect. And I said, it's too good a joke, you know? <laughs> it's like life can be cruel, so we kept it in. But Richard Gere wasn't the only famous actor to be shredded in Kevin Williamson's razor-sharp script. So we had the small cameo, and we read a lot of people, and it was just one of those things. Henry Winkler came in and nailed it. You know, when he's threatening the two kids with the scissors and everything like that, you are like, this guy's crazy. You're absolutely right. It is not fair. Fairness would be to rip your insides out. To see Fonzie getting killed in a movie was pretty amazing. Even Wes Craven could not escape being caught up in one of the film's many inside jokes. There's a famous shot of the janitor sweeping the hallway. Did you call me? Huh? Not your friend. And it's just Wes with a Freddy hat and, and sweater on. Somebody asked me, you should do a, like a Hitchcock cameo. I always push it off and say, oh, no, no, I don't want to do it, I don't want to do it. So said, you have to do it, why don't you be the janitor? So um, the day before I sent down and got uh, the whole Freddy costume, which I had squirreled away in, in storage. I felt ridiculous and everything, <laughs> but you know, we put it in there and uh, people seemed to like it. So what, what can I say? With its self-conscious jokes and inside references, Kevin Williamson's title, Scary Movie, seemed to be perfect, but not everyone agreed. I said, you've got the wrong title. And he said, why? And I said, it's a scary, terrifying movie with elements of comedy. The original title of Scream was Scary Movie, so, and we all loved it. And then we heard that um, Bob wanted to call it Scream. We were not happy at all 
that they changed the title. You know, it was a mandate. It was absolutely a mandate from Bob and Harvey that we changed the title. Michael Jackson had a um, song out, and Harvey's listening to it, and of course the song was Scream. So I called them up, and I said, guys, we've got the title, Scream. And when that came out of his mouth, it was like there was a moment of, of silence. Everyone was like, yes, that's the title of the movie. Um, that was one of the places where Bob prevailed, <laughs> thank God. When you see the Scream movies now, that they ever could have been called something else is amazing. They are Scream. With a completed film, an R rating, and a new title, Wes Craven's Scream was finally ready to be unleashed on moviegoers. But one pressing question remained. Would audiences be willing to line up for a slasher film during what many deem the most wonderful time of the year? On December 20th, 1996, at the height of the holiday movie season, a slasher film that combined horror and dark humor was unleashed on the public. That film was Wes Craven's Scream. What Bob said is, uh, you know, nobody comes out with horror films at, at Christmas. And all of a sudden, <gasps> I felt it would be the perfect programming. I said, what, what does a teenager go see during Christmas? What do they take Christmas off? Uh, Bob, that's when everybody goes to see family films. He says, exactly. So the horrid audience has nothing to see. So there was the idea to say, great, you know what? Let's go against the grain and let's build the audience um, from there. And um, lo and behold, he puts it out at Christmas. Everybody was thinking that we're doomed. A variety, four weeks before we came out, called us DOA. While the film earned $6.4 million in its opening weekend, it was hardly the early Christmas present everybody had been hoping for. I got the numbers in the first weekend, and it was like, okay. I said, that's it. People were writing, Wes Craven's washed up, which I get about every 10 years. We went to see our movie, and there was nobody in the audience. Do you want to die, Sydney? I thought, oh, you know, we didn't nail it. We didn't get it. It's not going to make a lot of money. Despite early critical pans and a less than spectacular opening, Scream began to show signs of life. There was something special happening. The second week, it made about the same no drop. I can't emphasize what a big deal that is. No drop. Third weekend, up higher than the first weekend. Everybody went, wow. And then bang, it took off. While audiences were shocked and delighted by the film, so too were the cast and filmmakers by Scream's rise to success. It was like word of mouth. Once that happened, I was like, uh-oh, we're on to something. It was the picture that just would not quit. It was just like, wow, this movie is really the little scary movie engine that could. And then it just kept going and going and going until it made, you know, $5 billion or whatever. The film eventually brought in a final tally of $103 million in the United States, staying in theaters an astounding 31 weeks. The movie held the record for a long time as the highest grossing horror movie of all time. The movie made over $100 million and, and cost 16, so it's pretty good math. Scream, a film that reinvigorated the horror genre, not only broke box office records, it even won best film at the 1997 MTV Movie Awards. Clearly, the film was connecting with its audience in a powerful way. You know, it was something you'd never seen before, and that's, I think, one of the reasons why the movie did so well at the time. I knew it was going to be a really good movie as soon as he buried that knife into her chest. This one hit at the right time, in the right place, with the right cast. Scream certainly will be seen as the iconic horror movie of the 90s. And I think, like, sometimes that just happens with certain movies. You, you run into a moment where things come together at the perfect time, and you got a great director, an amazing writer, great crew and, and cast. And uh, then you kind of capture lightning in a bottle. While the on-screen chemistry of the cast was undeniably part of audiences' love affair with Scream, the off-camera experience was having the same effect on two of its co-stars. I'm sorry. I'm on duty. <laughs> Wes had sort of like a, you know, a get-together. I immediately went up to her and started flirting with her. Courtney, uh, I'm David. I'm playing doing. She goes, yeah, I've heard about you. I said, oh, really? I've heard about you, too. I think uh, Courtney initially was like, yeah, he's cute, but um, this guy's nuts, you know? <laughs> I'm like, she's a good actress, because I really believe that her character is falling for him. It was immediately we were off to the sort of flirtation races. And while life was looking bright for the cast and crew of Scream, 
It also left the door wide open for other studios and filmmakers to cash in on the horror movie's sudden success. The Scream movies were truly an adrenaline shot to the heart of horror. The horror genre just came back, you know, it came back very powerfully. There's been a slew of horror films that have come out after Scream. The studio sort of jumped on the bandwagon and started to make a lot of films and realized that audiences were really looking for that. I think Scream was definitely the catalyst for all these other movies, you know, like Valentine or I Know What You Did Last Summer. Urban Legend was another one. There was a bunch of them coming out. Scream became so heavily imitated. It almost became a parody to have kids referencing other movies. You know the part in scary movies where somebody does something really stupid and everybody hates them for it? This is it. You know, that's the curse of when you do something new and original. But the top spot of all horror slasher films still belong to Scream. And Ghostface would go on to terrorize Sydney and her friends twice more in Scream 2 and Scream 3, both of which turn the conventions of horror sequels on their head. Let's face it, baby, these days, you gotta have a sequel. When um, I read the original script of Scream, he already had the sequel mapped out. In the end of the script was a five-page treatment for the next Scream. He knew where he was going. So we got to follow Sydney, you know, obviously from high school and then on into college and then into young adulthood. So that was uh, almost unprecedented, I think, for, uh, for films in the genre. And uh, really, uh, one of the things that kept me with it. It's been the same cast throughout. And also, we've had a lot of the same crew throughout, which is wonderful, because it, it, it feels like going back to summer camp every time we do it. It's a really fun experience. Seeing that the core cast comes back each time with Wes, um, the, it's not screaming without that. The sequels are fun, and I enjoy them. But that first one was truly, purely terrifying. You know, rather than thinking I was doing sequels, I was doing, you know, elements of a trilogy, which I, I just loved. It was that enduring love for the Scream franchise that brought about the return of Craven, Williamson, Campbell, Arquette, and Cox for another round of mayhem 10 years after the events of Scream 3. Get out! Get out behind you! Scream 4 was really interesting. You know, the, the new cast kind of felt like the old cast. They all hit it off, and there, there was a definite camaraderie there feels reminiscent of Scream 1. All of us thought it might just be a real kick to go back to it. Um, I was apprehensive at first, and I really wanted to know that Kevin would come up with a great concept. Make the remake of the groundbreaking movie. Halloween movie. takes his chainsaw down to the dead, kills him, hides in Amityville Horror, on Christmas, House of Wax, Mom, and I have Bloody Valentine. It's one of those, right? None of the ever. By following some rules of the genre, but daring to break others, Scream has made audiences laugh, cheer, and of course, scream. And in the process, it changed the face of fear. If you want to be on a roller coaster ride, you want to go into a dark theater, have the lights turn out, and just there's something about being scared out of your wits that has always appealed to me, and I think it appeals to everybody. I would say there's three important people that are sort of the tent poles of, of Scream. One is Kevin, who came up with the idea and wrote this fantastic script. One is Bob Weinstein, who was willing to go in and put a lot of money on the line. And the other, I guess, would be me. The three of us working together um, is a pretty powerful package. And I'm very proud that uh, Wes is there for all of them. Here he's done one, two, three, and four, and hopefully he'll do them all. And uh, I, I like keeping that continuity. The stars aligned to bring us all together to make something that, I don't know, really made cinematic history. It really kind of got to me and even seeing it you know I scream and laugh and, and it's just really witty you know it's just it just really works in so many ways I remember being there and they're like it's going to change your life and this is unbelievable and huge and you know this is gonna put you on the map and I went to this little like place to eat and some girl goes you you look like that guy from the from scream the, the rule guy and I was like really she's like yeah I was like, it was like the first time in my life I was ever recognized. It will always have a special place in my heart. And the fans, they made it. They made it what it is. And I treasure the filming of Scream as my happiest filming experience. Scream's meant well, everything to me, really. I mean, I'm so thankful for Wes for casting me and, and for Kevin for writing such amazing script. It's been a blessing and, and it's been a fun movie to be a part of.
but especially I met my wife on it, and you know, I have a daughter now because of this, and you know, it's pretty much doesn't get any better than that. I love this kind of movie. Um, never imagined myself ever being in a movie that, that <laughs> was like this. And um, just do something different, work with Wes Craven. It couldn't be anything better than doing a Wes Craven movie. So it was a fantastic ride, and it's been one ever since. I think Kevin Williamson wrote a brilliant script from the beginning. We managed to pull off its brilliance. I think audiences love them. I think um, they're highly entertaining. They were great successes. They did great things for all of our careers. They were really fun to make. Um, yeah, and I'm really grateful to have had them in my life. It was my first film, and I got to work with, you know, one of my idols, Wes Craven, who actually, you know, has become a good friend, and it's just been, it's been like a love experience for me. I couldn't have asked for a better first foray into movie making. As a director, um, you know, it's my, my most successful film by, by far, and it has kept me in touch with a very young audience, a very smart audience, and I'll keep making them as long as it's fun. Thank you all, and love you all. Gut you like fish.